Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the TetraCast. This is RPG Sites' weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. I'm your host. My name is Brian Vitali. I have the full crew here today. Joining me, I've got Josh Torres. We're happy to be back and happy to relink with some of my favorite people on the internet. Is it because of Chinese New Year? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, we have Chow Min Wu. How's it going? We have Adam Vitali. Hello. And we have James Glizio. All right. Mm. Uh, James. We promise nice. he's here. Okay. <laughs> he must have stepped aside. Oh, we'll keep it. We'll fix it in post, or maybe not. So, yeah, obviously, uh, we have last week, we was a little bit of a quieter week as we ramped up into all the things that were going to be happening this week. And then uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, we have a lot of features that have gone up on the site in the last seven days across basically the entire purview of our site. Um, the big one, of course, and we're going to be talking about this a lot, Fire Emblem Engage. That'll be the main topic of this podcast. But also, you know, we added the uh, Persona 3 and 4 releases on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation and other consoles. Uh, we have a couple previews for some games that are coming out in February or later with Wolong and Labyrinth of Galleria. A few other features that have gone up, gone up on the site that talk about games that released last year. And of course, a lot of new trailers, some of which... Uh, involve grand blue fantasy relink as josh alluded to in his introduction so oh, that's what last week <laughs> oh yeah oh that was very coy of him uh but yeah last week a little bit of a a little bit of a gap week but uh as we have uh, implied several times from this point forward it looks like it's going to be quite a lot to go through each and every week at least for the next two months or so so without further ado we'll kind of go straight into it uh we do have a lot of articles that we would normally shout out um at the start of the podcast here that are up on RPG site. Now, but some of these we will be talking to at length with some gameplay impressions. So first of all, I'm going to go through the ones that are uh, a little bit... Actually, should we do the should we do the main topics first or should we do the article shout outs first? Whatever you want. Whatever you all feel right. like doing. All right. It's up to me. I am the decision maker. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. We'll go through a few of these other uh, article shout outs first. Um, so some of these are games that we've had plenty of time on the podcast to talk about previously, but now we've got them up in written form. Uh, one of which is a review that Adam put up a little bit late, but because, you know, the winter season was pretty busy. And of course, Adam had two reviews going up this week. And that is all, not only Fire Emblem Engage, more on that later, but Romancing Saga Minstrel Song. So a, a big Square Enix remaster that snuck in in December. If Adam would kind of cheekily tell you the best Square Enix remaster of December. Uh, so Adam, I know that you've talked about Minstrel Song a few times on this podcast. I don't know if you want to just give uh, a couple minutes of what you wrote up and decide to formalize into your remastered version review that's up on the site. So, yeah, I, you know, I think I've in previous episodes have stated, you know, my basically my general feelings towards Minstrel Song. But, you know, it's a game that I really, really like. I think it's one of the best RPGs ever made. Now, I'm not saying that it's, you know, for everybody or the most approachable RPG, because it's definitely not. And I'm not saying, you know, this is a game that that has appeal to like a wide audience, because that's certainly not the case. But if you're a certain type of person looking for a certain type of thing in a certain type of RPG, then Minstrel Song might be for you. Um, there are dozens of us. Uh, as the meme would say, I, but, I, I uh, enjoyed uh, Adam's tactics uh, on the on the site on the day because yeah, he he published both the Fire Emblem Engage and Minstrel Strong Remastered uh, on the same day, and uh, you know I was I was looking uh, through it. I was like, not only did he give it uh, a higher score than Engage, but it it got the 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 header for a while before before we put Engage up. It was very yeah. cheeky of Adam. I like that. I, I I didn't actually make it the header. Alex did. <laughs> or I assume it was Alex. So it wasn't, that wasn't me. I didn't touch it. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I have one thing to say. I, I feel sorry for the people that started with Unlimited Saga first. There's a bunch of people that come into our our uh, Discord channel and they're like, hmm, I started with Unlimited Saga and that was a god-awful game. That is so funny. But I want to try out this game thanks to the glowing recommendation from Adam. And, <laughs> and it's like, well... <laughs> Yeah, a terrible first experience, so it's hard to judge it from there. It, it's it, and you speak of a limited saga. And I remember watching a speed run of it. Uh, the, there's a there's like this uh, Japanese speed run event. I forgot. I'm forgetting the name off the top of my head. I, I apologize, but they, the, one of the speed runs there was unlimited saga using the 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 animal and uh, just kind of using the, the economy in that game to like 
reach unwitting condition to tackle the final boss. Like <laughs> in, a, in a very speed run like perspective, I'm like it's really funny how optimized that route is and like what people have chosen to like get to that to the winning state in that game. It's it's fascinating. Truly a relic of its time. <laughs> but anyways, I um I've already written at length several times about Saga in general and its general like philosophy of the games. Really what it comes down to, if I had to like condense it all into like one word or rather two words, it's player discovery in that you kind of just have to discover the game, the places in the game, the stories in the game, how the game even works in some regards, kind of on your own. And I'm saying that's a good thing in terms of realizing how the game works, you know, the the, the construction of the world, the world building, the characters, there is a story. Um, and kind of you, it's not like delivered to you as like most RPGs, especially Japanese RPGs, would do it in terms of like a linear, straight front to back storyline. And that's kind of the appeal to the game is sort of, it really requires like curiosity and wanderlust to really get the most out of it, to just kind of, which way do you go? Just pick a direction and go somewhere, talk to somebody, go to the places they talk about. And one of the comments on the tw on Twitter when I tweeted about this, so my tweet was basically saying, to me, this is one of the best RPGs ever made. And there was a comment that was basically somewhere along the lines of, that's, you know, high praise for a game that requires a guide or something like that. Now, the thing is, is if you don't have any curiosity or wanderlust and you just want to look it up rather than learn it, figure it out, or find it, discover it for yourself, then sure, you can look up a guide. Um, but really, I think you get the most out of these sorts of games if you just don't. And just explore and wander. In fact, how I usually play these sorts of saga games like Minstrel Song or Scarlet Grace or Romancing Saga 3 is I'll usually do a playthrough without a guide, just kind of figure, see what happens, go somewhere, see what, what I find. And then maybe later on a second or repeat playthrough, kind of look up, you know, what did other people find? Or, what, you know, what happens in this area that I never explored? That's what it or, used or to whatever. be, you know. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad that someone is still trying to play video games like that. Mm -hmm. it's like, like you know like it's always been a prevailing thing in video games especially when you know the internet became more prevalent you know uh over the years but like at an era where you know people didn't really use faqs or walkthroughs and they kind of just played what they had they rented what they what they saw was cool on the box art uh, and yeah. you know it was just, like i, I kind of miss that era of games to some extent like that, that that's kind of like if you that's kind of why I appreciate Elden Ring to an extent when it came out is like there there was so much uh hidden behind that game for like the whole community to discover it wasn't just like you know to some extent yes like the people who had early access to it to review it to make guides for it they they did some of the groundwork but a lot of like the cooler stuff people like talked about in their own little you know circles wider community of like things that happened to them like does that that sense of discovery that like is unique to them, like at that place at that time, you know, and like that that was such a cool moment that like we don't get enough of these days out of like it's gonna be weird when I go to games. replay that game at some point, whenever that is. Where now if it's like, how do I complete this quest again? I know there's a wiki somewhere that just says do this, then this, then this. And like obviously it's yeah. optional whether you indulge in that or not, but uh it was kind of nice just to not even have the option or temptation where it's just like you don't know where Rainy went or whatever. You, I mean, or, they, they, they even made it easier because they added, in the patch they added like you know he did, this is where the NPC is now on the map. You know, right. So, I haven't even played yeah. since that patch came out. Yeah. So so in a sense, like you know that, that there's an element of that game kind of lost to time unless you de deliberately did not update the game to to have mm -hmm. that. Like for me, like when I was playing like the launch state of that game, like it was really cool because when that game hit, I just disappeared for ninety plus hours. And, like, along the way, like, I actually did get, like, a pen and notepad and, like, take note. Like, once I saw the, like, oh, this game doesn't really tell me much on, like, how to follow these things. And uh, I know how, like, kind of, like, Souls-esque quest guidelines or quests go with them being a lot very obscure and how you progress them. Like, I just started writing shit. And I'm like, okay, this person was here. They said vaguely, like, you know, the, the gist of this. And then I'll just keep that in mind for later if anyone else, like, mentioned something like that. I think my only issue is like sometimes the NPCs kind of move 
without like kind of like a warning. They said, let's meet again over here. But then they didn't go over there because maybe there's some kind of like dialogue you probably miss in between and they're like completely off location. From yeah, it's, it's it's pretty finicky with that too, like in the launch state. Yeah, and, 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 uh, like a lot of that, a lot of that stuff was pretty fucked and like you, uh, the majority was like, it was, it was coincidence that you, you cleared some minor roadblock that like prevented them from showing up there. Anyways, uh, I don't want to say too much more because we have lots of other stuff to get to. Um, read my review. Uh, I think Minstrel Song or Scarlet Grace are both good places to start with Saga if you haven't. Scarlet Grace probably a little bit more so because it has a little bit more uh, in terms of uh, it's a little bit more user friendly. But really, these games are just the type of games you just kind of have to play it to really know what they're going for. So that's that. Okay, so there are a couple other handful of features up on the site that went up in the last week as well. The next couple are ones that James was able to put together. He Hello. was able to put up a... Hey, James. Hi, he's back. here. <laughs> so uh, James alive. was yeah working like a madman in the last week. Uh, he put up, I believe, three different previews up on the site, or I guess one's kind of a review impressions. So the main one is Wolong Fallen Dynasty. Uh, we will talk more about that one later, so we'll put a pin in that one. Uh, the other two that James put up, one of which is on the PlayStation 5 version of Monster Hunter Rise. Now this, of course, uh, at least my uh, impression was that this is a little bit difficult to write about because Monster Hunter Rise had such a staggered release that now this is kind of like the third time you get to talk about Monster Hunter Rise in sub capacity. James put up a, a written preview for the latest. Basically, Monster Hunter Rise is on everything now. James, was there anything sp specific about the PS5 version that's kind of worth drawing attention to? Um, well, as I mentioned in that uh, article, it's kind of interesting how the uh, PS5 and I assume Series X version just straight up have the PC graphics settings menu. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you can, like, pretty much every, like, option you have in the PC version, besides DLSS, for obvious reasons, you can change, with the only caveat being that um, the... You can super sample on the PC version up to, like, 150%. It's only up to 125% on uh, PS5. But it's still neat. Like, you have, like, three graphical presets one for performance one default one for graphics which is kind of like focusing on super sampling and it's just it, it runs well it it <laughs> like one of the things i said in the article is is that it's not quite as uh, impressive to me personally since i've been playing the pc version for uh the last like year because that's when the pc version came out but for, for anyone that hasn't played it yet or maybe only played it on Switch and were waiting for, like, a console version, like, there were, like, millions of people that played World on PS4 and Xbox, and now they can play it on... Well, now they can play Rise on PlayStation and Xbox if they want to. Were there any, like, dual sense stuff that they added to this, the, the PS5 yes. version? Yes, there's gyro aiming for ranged weapons. Oh, cool. There's, um... Adaptive trigger support for ranged weapons, and uh, they say that there's haptic feedback, but it doesn't feel noticeably different from like regular rumble. So I'm not mm. sure if that's really that much of a selling point. And these but, are the returnal uh, like like clicking for for the range stuff. Yeah, that, that'd be sick. It's kind of crazy yeah, overall, to think. Yeah. Uh, not too not too long ago, when the the age of the PlayStation Four Pro when that came out, where the consoles having a performance or graphics mode was novel, and now it's just like you get a full graphics menu on your console now, where that's it's kind of like have we finally arrived that we just have those toggles now on a PlayStation or on an Xbox or at some point on a on a Nintendo console? I don't know exciting stuff. The other feature that James put up on the site is for a game that's coming out in February. So we'll obviously have the full release details then, but that is for Labyrinth of Galleria, the Moon Society. Now, this is the follow-up uh, to Labyrinth of Refrain, Coven of Dusk. And the tr tricky thing here is that James wrote up a preview for the English release of this game coming out next month, but James has already played the game in Japanese. I do know that yep. Adam <laughs> is... Uh, also excited for this game getting its official English release next month as well. So, James, again, kind of a little bit of a tricky angle you got to put here because you're previewing specifically the localized version for an audience that likely hasn't played the game in Japanese. 
but yeah. you basically titled this something pretty strongly poised to be one of the best rpgs of 2023 so i'll just kind of leave you with your own headline and say how excited are you for uh this game coming out next month in english well i'm excited to just see how people feel about it because i mean i've already played it I i'm not planning on on replaying it just because of how busy like uh, the next couple of months of releases are but um yeah I loved this game when it came out in Japanese. I was like really surprised because uh, it, I'm not sure if folks remember this, but like Labyrinth of Galleria was originally scheduled to come out in like spring 2019. And for a while there, like when it got delayed, we didn't know if it was actually still coming out. We didn't know like what the state of the project was. And then it was only like three or four months before it ultimately came out in Japan, like at the end of 2020, where they said, "Okay, it's coming out now." That was and also around. That was also around the time where I remember, like, Disgaea RPG was a mess, and NAS. <laughs> we were wondering, like, what was going on, like, if they were going to live, and they have. But right. yeah, there was uncertainty. And, and honestly, I, I, I that's the main reason. That. Yeah, and honestly, that's the main reason why I imported Glory at the like in the first place was I was very curious. It's like, okay. Is it going to actually be any good? And also, since I loved the Labyrinth of Refrain, and again, there was all that uncertainty about uh, NIS, I was like, will this be localized? Because I'm not sure if this company's going to be around much longer. Which, granted, thankfully, that has not been the case, but very, uh, very interesting remembering that situation that they were in not that long ago. Um, but yeah, uh, interesting thing to note here is that uh, we actually like this preview for the localized version was actually an exclusive that was offered to us. So we we were the first uh, outlet that got a chance to get hands on with the uh, localized version of the game. I actually didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yep. So, yeah, um, it's uh not too much in the preview because we only got a chance to take a look at the uh, opening hour or so of the game. And but we did capture some gameplay so people can see some of the early like uh, localization and see some snippets of gameplay. So, yeah. So I forward uh, to seeing how people feel about this. I see your thumbnail here. I just kind of assumed you were playing a PC uh, release, but it looks like you're playing a Switch release. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. The Vita lives on in spirit. <laughs> It was very funny because um, the way it worked is that me and the uh, one of the uh, PR guys at uh, NIS uh, America ended up just uh, meeting up at this uh, random, uh, not restaurant. It's like, do you guys ever have like these like kind of like outside cafeteria, like restaurant things where there's like a couple of different places that you can get food from, but they share like kind of like a, a, a dining area? No, yeah, I, I have uh, this is not the, like I know what you're talking about. It's sort of like a food court, only not so a little bit yeah. higher than that. <laughs> yeah. So basically they brought well, I brought my laptop to hook up uh, my capture card to and they brought their a switch uh, dev kit. And technically, we were just playing it in public. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. It reminds me of Adam playing a uh, Fire Emblem Engage before I came out uh, in the airport. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just playing it in the airport. Yep. Get security on them. They're breaking the law. So uh, a couple other uh, written articles that are up on the site. So, of course, we've gone through the Romancing Saga Mistral Song Remaster Review, the PlayStation 5 version of Monster Hunter Rise, got a write-up, Live in the Galleria Preview. Um, Adam and Quentin worked together to put up an interview or a set of questions and answers for Tactics Ogre Reborn from last year. So, Adam, was this something that they reached out to us for, or was this something that we submitted questions to them? But... So I saw basically I saw the output of the article, what ended up coming to be and what's up on the site right now. But I don't know like what led up to this. Uh, basically, so we we have we, we keep in touch with Square Enix in a lot of ways because obviously they release like a million RPGs or at least last year they did. Um, and they just had like, hey, we have an op we, we, uh, we have an opportunity for you to you know ask some questions to the team behind uh, Tactics Ogre Reborn. Do you want to ask them anything? And these are these are what are referred to as ad hoc interviews where especially when there's like the the language barrier translation time needed a lot of times japanese developers in their english pr will do this where it's like you will submit questions via text 
obviously they get translated so they can be answered and then translated back. Um, so an ad hoc interview, we just sent over a couple of questions, 10 questions about you know the game and its reception, and uh, they replied back. Um, this is from the director, the producer, and the lead game designer of Reborn. Um, and, you know, uh, I asked questions about, like, uh, things like the card mechanics, which the answer to that was they just wanted people to have, like, strategy on the fly, which is, you know, fair enough. Uh, questions about um, the reception, they were a little bit, uh, they kind of shied away from those. Maybe they didn't want to say anything too much yet. So, you know, it's, you can read it on the site. It's a little, a little bit, uh, it's a good copy on on some insight to the game development. So we have those questions and answers up on the site as well. It is uh, called Tactics Over Reborn Interview, How Square Enix Approached Revisiting a Beloved Classic. One of the other major releases of the last week, of course, that I mentioned at the outset was the release of Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden on the other consoles or on PC in Persona 3 Portable's case. Uh, so we have basically impressions from each of these on the site for Persona 3 Portable, Scott White was able to write up basically not quite a review, but it's more of an op-ed uh, feature for the release of Persona 3 Portable, talking about how it's finally, you know, it's nice to have that game not shackled to the PSP anymore. There's a little bit of discussion on the fact, you know, the well-worn fact that there is no, quote, definitive version of Persona 3. There's been rumors floating around that we can't substantiate at all about a remake of this game, but there have been. Those rumors have existed for forever. <laughs> so who, who knows how much like meat there is on that bone. But Scott was able to put up uh, his opinions on Persona 3 Portable as a, a win for preservation, a win for new series fans, gives them an option to go back and play that game uh, on a more, you know, in a convenient way. But of course, with the limitations in mind that it was uh, originally developed for the PSP. And of course, one of the things that has kind of gone not quite viral, but just kind of a fun little note is how the save menu for the PC version of that game just looks like the PSP save menu as a fun, little, um, a fun little legacy thing there. Yeah. Um, Persona 4 Golden, of course, is a little bit less novel because it did get its kind of surprise PC release a couple of years ago. Uh, which Adam covered pretty thoroughly uh, back when that came out. But now, of course, it released on Xbox and Switch as well. So uh, Cullen basically took a pretty fun, goofy take on this, talking about how playing Persona 4 Golden on Switch, finally, you can play Persona 4 Golden on a handheld. Yes, he's aware it's on Vita. It's a joke if you don't get that. But uh, just kind of, again, fun to have this game available. Not everyone has a PC. Not everyone has a Vita, so it's kind of good to just have this available on Nintendo Switch in a uh, in a modern, uh, convenient way for a really good game, a game that onboarded a lot of people to the series, and of course, when Persona 5 onboarded even more, now both of these games, the entire Persona series is now available on a modern console. Yeah, the entire Persona series, <laughs> correct. It's okay. Oh. You you can you can play Persona 1 and 2 on Xbox. Uh, what are those? What's what about that? 1 and 2? Nobody well, care? Who? Where's what? the port of one and two? Persona, Persona three. Oh, what are those? Yeah. What are you talking about? Oh man. <laughs> of I course. Was, uh, I was hearing like Ryan says, like, oh, you can play every Persona game on the modern PC. Okay. It's like, mm -hmm. but what about one and two? Yeah. Oh, exactly. yeah. I'm, I'm like the uh, Simpsons character. That's the. We'll joke. see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Who well, knows? they, they, you know, Atlas gave them a little bit of a look in. They were in, they were included in that anniversary art, even though nothing came of it really. But they didn't they, forget they, them completely. They're they're open to porting PSP games to modern platforms. So you know, yeah, anything's possible, I guess. The tricky one being one of those PSP somehow didn't get uh, officially localized, but its original release did. Huh. You know. I'm, I'm talking about Eternal Punishment for Persona. Yeah, 2. I, I, yeah, I remembered one of the twos didn't come out officially. Yeah, it, it, it's it's always gonna it, it will never not make me laugh when I think about it. For the PS One, Innocent like for, for people who don't know, Persona Two got two releases, releases: Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment. Eternal Punishment is the direct sequel to Innocent Sin. Though you can kind of play it standalone and still be okay, but you know it's kind it gets kind of dicey there, but. Mm -hmm. On the PS1, Innocent Sin did not get localized, but Eternal Punishment did. And then on their PSP remakes, uh, Innocent Sin did get localized, but not Eternal Punishment. So if you want to play like the official English versions, you play the PSP version, and then you play the PS1 version. It's kind of weird. So, yeah, I guess it weird. makes sense, because back then, like uh, PS1 games could play on both uh, 
PS3 and PSP with like no issues. So it's like, I, I mean, I get why they did it. it yeah, know, I mean, so. like like in Eternal Eternal Punishment came so late in the PSP life cycle, and you know the PSP is pretty much dead in the West by right then. I get it, but it's still so irritating. <laughs> So we'll see. We'll see. Whatever you know, the, the the doors open now for an official localization. Should they undertake it, I think I think those games would sell now because the the, the remakes are you know they're pretty user friendly for the most part, and not the PS One games. And related to those two Persona articles on Three Portable and Four Golden, uh, Alex, James, and I believe Scott have all been working uh, on guides for both of those games. So if you're playing them and you need help on a social link or anything like that. Hopefully you Google and you find our guides. If not, use whatever guide you like or don't play with a guide, you know, back in the old day when we didn't have those. But uh, those are up on the site as well. Figure I at least call them out because those do take a lot of work and time to put together. And I know that James and Alex have been working really hard in basically cataloging those games. And now that they're on modern consoles going forward, making them just kind of easy for people to play through the whole series, at least three through five. I I'm trying to remember. I know for the original v- vanilla based Persona Three release, it was pretty difficult to do 100 percent social link on a full playthrough. Oh. Unless you felt you very you follow a very specific. Yeah, this is actually something I had game. forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to forget if the was more lenient or not. In Persona Three FES, I never played the original, but in FES, it's also like this. In FES, when you're playing as male character. All the f- social links with the female characters are romances. Yeah. There is no romance or friendship routes. They're all romances, but you can't have more than one romance going at a time. It's it's, a, it's it has it heavily it pretty much penalizes you for doing. Yeah, because they'll get mad at you, and then the link breaks. I believe. Yeah, this um, was, I apologize. This was I might be a little wrong, but it's something like that. So I remember yeah. if you wanted to do a max social link run in Persona Three FES, what you would have to do is you'd have to like raise yukari to rank seven and then you automatically romance get her up to 10 and then once she's at 10 then you can go to uh, i don't know mitsuru and start her at seven and get her to 10 and then when she's done then you can go to fuka and so on so you kind of had to be very careful to not romance more than one at a time but in persona 3 portable first of all there's now romance or friendship routes for all the characters and second of all it doesn't matter if you romance more than one um so okay, it's so it's more the, okay. It's, no, it's no, more. there's a lot of things I remember from the original Persona Three. Um, like if you don't like attend like people's social link like for a while, they just like become like broken. Unless yeah, the, 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 there's a, the, like the, like social links could reverse and break in like in Persona yeah, because they were like, still a new concept. It's like you didn't see me for a while. It's like I thought we're not friends anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like come on it's only been two weeks that's right persona 3 is the one that that, that, that emulates real relationships the most <laughs> but um another thing i did remember is that even if i fall in a strictly in a guide and in the og one i think you only have exactly five days left on a on a fresh playthrough yeah it's pretty tough it, it, it's pretty intense like you you you, you either make it or you don't <laughs> there's there's <laughs> no, there's no way to really salvage it unless you have a shitload of save slots but in Persona Five, you basically got a month of like spare time of nothing. You, you be, in, per, in Persona Five, Persona Five, you pretty much had to like try not to max everything. They're pretty easy to do. Hundred percent. Pretty lenient. Yeah. Because I think the most lenient part is that there is two mechanical systems that they added that kind of let you exploit it. Like versus the fortune turret, yeah. and the other one is the which one is the massage one the one that you come back and at night and then you get a massage and then you could still do night activities i forgot which one that uh, it was like what was it that was i forget which tarot it is but yeah the kawakami you get the massage yeah once you get those two it's like yeah it's like easy game easy peasy yeah so with that, we've run down all of the features up on the site that we just want to give a quick look in. And of course, now we're going to go into the features that are probably going to be in the thumbnail of this. So if you're if you're looking forward to more Fire Emblem Engage discussion, you've hit the right timestamp. Of course, we've talked about Fire Emblem Engage from a preview sense the last two weeks. I know we're going into week three, but this is our first opportunity to talk about the game at length now that the embargo is up and the game is officially released. Uh, Adam, of course, has been spearheading our review coverage for this game. I do believe that Alex and Scott have contributed on a few guides that are going up on the site as well. Uh, And obviously, Scott wrote up the preview for the game. But Fire Emblem Engage, Adam has written our official review up for the site. And a few of us, I know, of course, have picked up the game and started playing it. 
but I will start off this discussion by handing the proverbial microphone over to Adam. Adam, I know you've been a big Fire Emblem fan. I think you've pretty much played every game, but like two or something like that, Gaiden, or I guess original Gaiden. two and original three. Gotcha. I played the remakes so, of both. So of course, um, you might just need to start at the baseline here. I know some of your initial impressions you were able to kind of discuss with your preview coverage, but now that your your shackles have been released or whatever, uh, Fire Emblem Engage. A lot of people have had a lot of different uh, impressions on the marketing of this game and what this game is and what this game isn't. So I know that's kind of difficult to sift through, but here that's what we're going to do our make our best attempt at here today. Okay, uh, first of all, who here has like picked up the game and started? I know you have. I am now at chapter six, like I did one battle okay. on chapter six. So that's okay. Okay, so I'll hand it off in just a second because I've already spoken quite a bit about the game. It'd be nice to get you know another voice rather than mine. Because, um, anyways, uh, I put up my review last week. If you listened to the previous two podcasts when I gave like my preview impressions, it shouldn't have been a surprise. I kind of just you know wrote out the opinions that I verbalized in those podcasts. And so I don't have a whole lot more to say than I haven't already said. If, I wrote 2,000 words on the game, but if you want to boil it down to a nutshell, I think, you know, a lot of the gameplay, tactical, you know, combat elements of the game are its strong suit. Those are the things that I attach to personally. I think the story and the characters are just a little bit more, they're not, I wouldn't say they're poor, they're just kind of like straightforward, thin. It's not a Saturday morning cartoon. Well, that's what I think of it as. Say that again. It's a Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. Um, so and I'm not saying that like, you know, well, how do I put this? Well, I should, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. So depending on what you're coming to Fire Emblem games for, you know, each Fire Emblem game has its own, you know, strengths and weaknesses in terms of which facets it emphasizes or, or where its strengths lies and whatnot. And depending on precisely what you, general you, are looking for in a Fire Emblem game, uh, some, you know, you may, this may sound like right up your alley or it might sound a little bit, you know, not what you were looking for, not what you're hoping for. Um, so, like, for example, one of the things I said in previous podcasts was there's a, not a lot of romance in Fire Emblem Engage. I'm not saying that as a positive thing or a negative thing. I'm just trying to be descriptive for those who are either looking for this or not. Is like, if you started with Awakening or Fates, those games, there's a lot of romance. And I mean both between your main character and whoever you choose, and also just between the cast. Literally in that game, in Awakening, you're just pairing up your, your romances. There's a lot of it. It's almost like the focus of the game. And that's not the case in uh, Engage. It wasn't really the case in Three Houses either. Um, Someone actually got mad at me in the previous podcast. I'm actually going to read their quote. Uh, first of all, before I do that, uh, I have no doubt that the majorities of the listeners to this podcast are nice people, kind people, and well-adjusted people. <laughs> but sometimes you get these <laughs> off-the-wall uh, comments that make you laugh. Um, so this person said, I saw the leaks. Screw you. There is romance. I love Awakening. I love mm -hmm. Fire Emblem. And it's actually, this is actually a little bit grammatically incorrect here. I love Awakening and I love Fire Emblem, Fire Emblem, if it not strong in this game, but it is still romance. Mm. So what I said was there is not a lot of romance, but there is some. And now what I can say now that, I've un now that I've been released from the preview embargo restrictions is that in the game, Alir can have an S support with any other character in the game, or I believe it's any other character. I haven't like exhausted all of it. And it gives you like a little CG art panel, just like it does in Three Houses. And, you know, the characters generally that you get like three or four lines of dialogue where they're like, let's be together when this is all over. Um, so that is in the game. And potentially that might just that might be sufficient. That might be what people want to see. That might be, you know, good enough that you can pick any other character in the game. You can essentially propose to them and you get a CG art. To me, the way I perceive it. That is the, the extent of the romance in the game. There's really not much outside of that. I even said it in my review that it almost feels like they included this in the game, almost out of just, like, obligation. Like, Alir's C, C supports, not a lot of romance. B support, not a lot. A support, not really. But that S support gets a little bit more a little bit romantic. So it is there. 
But that's about it. It's limited to that. And again, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just trying to be descriptive. That's what it is. And I didn't really want to spend so much time focusing on that. I just wanted to describe it for people who are looking for it. There's, there's that. Well, you that's know it. what? Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, in terms of the game itself, I said the things that I that I attach to most strongly personally uh, are the combat design, the the emblem mechanics is a nice little wrinkle that of course makes it different from every other Fire Emblem game. Um, there's 12 emblems in the game plus more in DLC that any character can equip any emblem. So you know, there's a lot of different permutations in terms of how characters can be you know prepared to like to coordinate your team and to approach battle. And I think that's really cool, especially on the harder difficulties where you might have to be very uh, considerate about which emblems you use and how you use them and on which characters and which weapons and whatnot. And then that's what really draws me. And there's been a, a little bit of talk about how Fire Emblem Engage, I know a lot of people have sort of said it feels like older, more classic Fire Emblem games in the series, and I agree with that to an extent, because there is no there is no calendar system, there are no lectures, um, so you can go straight from one story battle to the next story battle to the next story battle if you'd like, and it does keep the pace a little bit up. If you were one of those people who uh, maybe weren't a fan of Three Houses because you thought maybe the calendar and the lectures slowed things down, then this might be more up more, more up your alley. I actually personally thought that the that the subsystems in three houses, the motivation, the lectures, the, the the proficiencies, and how that translated into battle, I thought it actually synergized pretty well, though it did, admittedly, slow things down a bit. And even though I, I did, you know, actually kind of like that setup, it's not something I really wanted to see in every single Fire Emblem game going forward, and indeed it's absent here. So, you know... Again, I'm not necessarily saying that one design is necessarily absolutely better than the other. I'm just trying to be descriptive that they are different. And you may have a bias towards one or the other. Now, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that people were maybe... Oh, here's the last thing I'll say before I hand it off. So last week's podcast, I mentioned that I was going to look more into like map design and objectives just to kind of get a little bit more of a concrete feel about like how does this compare to Three Houses or other games? Because I know a lot of people, especially people who have played like every Fire Emblem game, they're, they're, this is something that is really interesting to them, and they're, they're, um, that's one thing they're looking forward to. Kind of the conclusion I, game, I came to is that Engage's maps, they're not as good or not as interesting to me as like Conquest, which is to me like almost like a high watermark as far as like map design goes. But I do think they are maybe a notch above three houses. And, and what I mean by that is that there's more opportunities to like use a choke point or to have like defenders in, in a certain position to have ranged people in, you know, behind them, a little bit more of those tactical elements in the game rather than uh, death balling or turtling your way to victory in every map. I do think Engage is maybe just a notch stronger than Three Houses, but one thing I'd actually kind of had forgotten about in Three Houses, in its paralog slate, there actually are a good handful of maps that have like a defend objective, like defend this position or these five squares, or like a survive objective, you know, where you're surrounded on all sides and your objective is not necessarily to win, like to, to, to route the enemy, but to just survive for long enough, or to, to, to prevent any enemies from like entering a certain zone. And Engage actually doesn't really have much of that at all. So, kind of in a nutshell, I would say that the map design in Engage is a notch above Three Houses, but the objective design is maybe a little bit more boring, because there's more maps that are just uh, route or defeat the boss. And, you know, are these, like, staggeringly different, where one is, like, leaps and bounds above the other? I wouldn't say so. But that's, the, that's kind of the conclusion I came to and I came to in revisiting what were the maps and objectives in Three Houses and in Conquest and in uh, this game like. So, I mean, not saying you have to agree with me, but that's just sort of the feeling that I come away with. Now, Josh has started playing this game. What do you think so far? I think you know, when I treat it like Fire Emblem's uh, Fates Conquest, I enjoy it because, like, you know, Conquest to me is some of the like most fun i've had with the with the fire emblem series so but in that game i literally didn't care about the story i didn't care about any of the characters i can't even remember a single person's name in conquest um 
But I remember they some a lot of these people were useful for very, very, very highly situational scenarios, which is a lot of conquest of like that, like the like don't be masked. Like uh, you'll never touch this person until this one thing in conquest, and then they're like the MVP of that map. <laughs> and it's just like, and I, I'm hoping like, um, I'm not saying that engage is gonna like maybe reach that high. I'm not really expecting conquest out of it, but of the, but I view it like conquest. Of like I don't really care much about these characters at the moment, but I do enjoy some of the maps that I've played so far. Like there's this castle map already in chapter six, and like there's you know, um, the the main objective is like there's this boss in like in like the throne room of, the, of that map. And you can you can approach it from the front, or you can go to the side and break a wall there that has some treasure chests there as well to incentivize you to go explore that route. So you already have like stuff like, hey, I'll break this wall, I'll, I'll make a, I'll make my own ch a choke point, have my uh, more armored units, you know, populate them as like enemies are like kind of flocking to them, and like uh, you, you adva advancing slowly on that because if I you chat too far, I you know. The, the the consequences are severe. I'm like I, I'm a hard classic, but I'm I, I've also been um, watching one of my friends playing on Maddening, and you know, for people who play on Maddening, like the main thing about what makes Maddening interesting, uh, or used to be called Lunatic in uh, Fire Emblem games, is like the first like playthrough of uh, of, of those uh, in that difficulty is like all your level ups are fixed. It yep. it's only RNG on the second playthrough of them, so. You know, it, it, it's a it's a vastly different experience because you 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 have to play a certain way because now you know that you pretty much know like that your characters are going to develop a, 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 in a certain way, and and the, the big thing about this game is like not only just like emblems and syncing with them and uh, taking uh, advantage of that, but uh, like break it becomes a very 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 thing and maddening. Like you 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 need to have like units that like have maybe some optimal setups but you need but you need them to like break certain uh, enemies so that they don't have a chance to like you know act as much this is uh, a dumb comment on my mind but i was trying to remind myself is break new to this game or was it in introduced in a D 3ds game um it, there was a fate sort of had a similar system somewhat yeah it, 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 like each each weapon had like five different like pips and you could like wear them out so they couldn't respond i i might get the details wrong but the break system as it is implemented in engage is pretty new yeah it just fates had a sort of similar thing so but the, like in general that's the that's how i kind of view the game is like it it is very much as we discussed two weeks ago and i was here like it is a gameplay first fire emblem you will enjoy it but if you like you know in engaging with the gameplay you know you like if you like if you like thinking about playing through tactical maps and strategies and you know kind of what i what i didn't know about this game is I, I didn't know they had like that um mechanic from three houses where it lets you like take back turns like oh i messed up so i'll go yeah. to like a, a previous turn like I didn't know that this game had it, and like the the way you get it is so kind of stupid. But that's kind of like the so far the game in general. It comes to like plot beats, the characters. It's kind of like it's kind of like it's like not not awful. It's just like okay, whatever, you know. Like so for me, when it comes to like it, it, like you know, I played through the Fire Emblems that like you know are very romance focused or very like you know interacting with your party members and like none of that stuff is offensive to me. And like and it's like. It's like fine, I'll like I'll do it, and like sure, I'll appreciate some of it. But I that was never the main draw of the series for me. Like uh, to me, like Fire Emblem first and foremost is the strategy RPG series that I like. You know, playing through for you know the the gameplay of it, the strategy, the tactics, um, cl classes, weapon types, um, and and seeing how each different entry handles. Like, what's their spin on it this time? What did they do different this time? I've you know, seen no. a lot of discourse about which Fire Emblem game does Engage remind you most of. And yeah. everyone's going to have different criteria to like how they weigh these things. Yeah. I've heard people say it's just like Awakening, which to me, I'm like, what? <laughs> that's uh, that's wild. Yeah, because like I've said, I've said several times now that Awakening is a matchmaking simulator and this game is not. Um, and then some people are like, it feels like a long lost GBA game, which actually I'm a little bit you know, leaning more that way. Okay. If I had to pick one, 
And again, this might be practically meaningless for me to say because everyone's going to value these things differently. It's like it sort of reminds me of sacred stones, only with the additional like somnial fluff that I mentioned in previous episodes. Because obviously, those that, that that sort of stuff didn't exist back then. Um, but the rest of the game kind of makes me feel like reminds me of sacred stones. Um, I can you know I could I could articulate why, but you know it just everyone has their own little kind of perspective on these things. I think it has a similar story, a similar kind of structure and f- format and flow otherwise, but... <laughs> I think yeah, the little bit uh... that you show me, uh, it does sh- kind of remind me of Sacred Stones, except I'm not grinding in the tower anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can grind on the map. That's similar to Sacred Stones. Yeah. I mean, the map, the map design looks really similar. Not the map design, but the map implementation, the UI is very yeah. Sacred Stones as to me when I saw you playing it. But yeah, I don't. I don't really have much to say about it. I'm still very, very early on. I I, I like what I see so far, and I'm just like, yeah, this is that to, to me. It's just like it's another Fire Emblem game, and I will play it, and I'll probably enjoy it. Like much like Three Houses, I came in with the same thing. It's like you know, like this is a, like Fire Emblem has gone in a different direction, and much like you, Adam. Like I hope it doesn't like stay like this. Um, I hope it does you know new things, and that, that's that's what makes fire emblem an appealing series where he's like it's not a series that that really stagnates a lot for me it's something that kind of involves with each each entry and every entry gives its own different flavor to it for better or for worse you know and this almost goes without saying but like engage is like clearly the best looking game in the series at least in the 3d series you could argue that the sprites were better and in some ways <laughs> i might agree with you but like comparing this to uh you know three houses or obviously like game era fire emblem much higher fidelity in the in the character models and the animations, uh, especially combat animations. They're very very dynamic. They're the best they've ever been. You'll probably still eventually turn them off after you've seen them hundreds of times. But it's a great looking game. There's clearly an improvement on that front, um, for sure. Yeah, I, the 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 arena is pretty funny because with the insomnia that your home base you can go to the arena and kind of train you up, up your units so if you want a unit to get some experience you can like go to the arena and have them fight like a random person so mm-hmm. it's really funny to see like how your units kind of interact with each other in battle because of that because like uh of how the, like how involved that the battle animations are in this entry like that's the the animation fidelity of it all and just like you seeing, know like what's up uh one sorry to interrupt yeah. uh the one character who I thought whose animations were like really dynamic, you get them in like the second half of the game, roughly or roughly the halfway point is Marin. Mm-hmm. She's the wolf rider or the wolf cavalry. I forget the name. Okay. And like the wolf will just kind of like just be jumping around all over the place and sometimes gets like really close to the battle camera itself. It's like That's rather, awesome. rather than just, you know, like left and right. Um, it's pretty cool. Like to see how dynamic they can get. It's pretty funny because I, I prefer like a weird thing to say, but like I kind of prefer the like seeing the battle animations over like, the cutscene choreography in this game like i think the cutscenes are kind of like eh, okay whatever mm-hmm. and because they're like the battle the, the the battle stuff it's like okay this is cool how they interacted with each other in the, in do you the, mean the, like like the pre-rendered cutscenes? yeah 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 because like th- there is something to be said like when it's pre-rendered you can pretty much have the characters animate however you want them to but like in battle it's like you have you know one unit versus another unit with like a a set of animations they can potentially have and then obviously depending on if you hit and also one thing i noticed in the battle animations is like the way a character will react can like vary if they're like hit with a weak attack or versus a strong attack so or if they get like a critical hit or but they're still alive so like yeah. there's also, like also like when a character's like in on the ground or there or the enemies are airborne like there's like actually like interesting like different animations for like specific states in battle in that game. yeah exactly and that, that's i think this is what you're getting at it's very interesting to see like this isn't pre-rendered these are just like there's a bunch of calculations going on behind the scenes yeah. in terms of which animation needs to play in which exact mode depending on who's fighting who and the state of the battle and it's like that's actually really cool that they're able yeah. to like do all this and, like, it, like, so it's I'm a not... stupid thing because like as, as soon as you hit attack like you know everything's already calculated there you're just seeing what the outcome is right uh you know but it, it, it's a it's just it's something that like kind of makes my neurons active so I'm not as far as Josh. So like, and he's not very far quite yet either. So I honestly feel like, oh, I don't have much to contribute here. Uh, but one thing that I will say that does feel smart is remember, as far as I can tell, it's not here in Engage yet. Remember in Three Houses, you could actually like control your unit 
behind the shoulder view and like use up your movement as you like actually there was like a mode that seemed like it got a lot of hype pre-release and then as three houses released no one actually used it to actually right. move units across the field and it seems like in engage they found a like a smart um they found a smart compromise it was uh, so just weird but then i moved my character the first time and i saw like whoa like, like what, what the hell's going on i know what you're getting at so yeah, engage. They just have two movement options: one where you pick the character, and then you basically can move them their entire whatever field it is. They're they're based on their movement speed, and then you have to just select. Okay, stop here. Of course, I'm a fossil, and I'm like, this isn't how the old games were. So I changed it so that you actually yeah, see like the arrow. Immediately. Um, yeah, yeah, immediately. Immediately, immediately the cursor mode. Yep. Yeah, and th this is more like three houses, but um, I do really enjoy. Like I, when I think of Fire Emblem, I still think of like. You go into your battle animation screen and then you load back onto your map screen. But here it's like one and the same where the camera will swing in and your unit will actually be represented by where they are on the map and what trees or walls or whatever are around them to do their animation. And it just people say immersive enough where it doesn't like mean much of anything anymore. But it it just feels really nice to know, like, OK, this this map is actually realized now. And that's mostly the same that was true on Three Houses. So this isn't novel, but combined with the the better production values um with the bold colors like three houses had a bit of a like a muted art style deliberately so um where this is a lot more bold it's got the vtuber look or whatever people said and i don't know i'm just really just enjoying how this game looks and feels and runs as a switch game um and it's i'm enjoying that a lot and i talked about the break system and i i think that's a, a fun little wriggle that kind of keeps the weapon triangle part of that intact i actually had a time where i'm like ah oh, alir is at full health he should be able to survive this then he got hit by a lance and it's like you're broken i'm like oh shit they can break yeah. me too god yeah. damn it. <laughs> things like that well, will will that um pay off a ton late game i don't know yet but it's a fun little wriggle and it kind of it keeps you like having like a little bit of that chess chess match uh, rock paper scissors sort of feel to it without that dominating the game. I, I I'm just thinking uh, like when it comes to like the story so far in the game, like I I I know I probably probably won't like you know be attached to it, but I'm just thinking it's kind of like a good thing to me that the story isn't like super good in this game because like when I look at the main character's design, right? I'm like, there's no way I can take a story seriously with that main character's design. So. In a way, I'm male or female? A female. So, mm -hmm. it's funny. It's like her face is like puffy too, like in the, uh, the cutscenes. And it's like it's it makes me laugh every time. Like I I I I can't like not laugh at it. So I'm just thinking like I can't I I wouldn't be able to like process or parse like a super serious good story with these character designs, especially the main character design. I just couldn't. So I'm just like you know what? I'm okay with the story being whatever. <laughs> I think I'm in the place where are these designs my favorite? No. Do I prefer like the Senri Kita designs or some of the even the three houses designs? I forget the artist there. Yeah, probably. But I really do just love the animation quality where that kind of like takes the bite off it where it's like, is this my perfect preferred way I would have a character's design in a Fire Emblem game? No, but I'm not making these. But I, I just enjoy the the color palette, the animation style, the visual quality. This game is just I'm, I'm in sometimes when I play a switch game, like when I was playing Breath of the Wild, it's like I wasn't enjoying it. Like you, you keep getting reminded that it's oh, this is a switch game. It's not running very well. I'm not getting that with with engage quite as much, which is kind of it's nice not to have to worry about you're I'm enjoying the game for what it is and not enjoying the game like, oh, too bad. This is a switch game or anything yeah, like that, which, like is, which is good. Yeah, yeah sort right. of thing. Are we that shallow? Of, are we? Yes. I look. The switch is getting old, man. It's just it, it's hard to not notice, right? Like for some games, like think about Age of Calamity or Hyrule Warriors, or, whatever. Or actually, like, I, don't, I don't. Yeah, I was actually going to say I don't know why I brought Breath of the Wild. That's kind of old hat at this point. Even though I guess maybe that conversation will kick back up in May. I but, am dreading having to play uh, Tears of the Tears Kingdom on Switch. I, I, I'm right? consider. I'm considering alternatives. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, Shin Megami Tensei Five that Adam just brought up was the last time where I was like, "Oh man, like this is a Switch game, and it's not." <laughs> you're reminded of it as you play through it. We're engaged, of course. It's a limited frame rate, but it's it's not as choppy, and it's being a strategy game where you're looking top down a lot of the time. That kind of takes the bite out of it, rather than being over the shoulder third third 
person, but I'm enjoying the game without having to worry about what console it's on or the capabilities of that console. The other thing I wanted to say is just very specific, and this isn't, I don't like, think it's new, new, but I enjoy the the tweak to healers. And Adam had mentioned it in one of his preview podcasts, the key art thing, or like the fact that your healer can do some attacks. Um, Martial arts, baby. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying that. Is that is that going to be a super substantial tweak? I don't know, maybe not, but it's, it's kind of fun to know, like, all right, uh, is it... F- Flam as the healer. Your healer can defend the... themselves to some slight extent. I know, but the, like the, the 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 sauce of them right now is chain guard because my, gro- my the growths on my on my healer have been god awful, which is you know. Flam is actually more person. like at least uh, so I ended up maxing every character's level once. I know you can do class changing and whatnot. Fram ended up for me being more of like a physical attacker than a healer. Oh wow, I she's <laughs> definitely not there yet for me if, if ever. <laughs> On, but that's that that's kind of the fun of rng level ups <laughs> yeah uh, i think i said in the past so like which characters like everyone's gonna one thing that's cool about the rng level ups is like on each playthrough for any person everyone's gonna have like a different character who becomes like their god unit or their their mvp because sometimes they just get like ridiculously good level ups or whatnot right yeah for me it was the the prince brothers from brodia were both like amazing diamant and uh Alchrist. Uh, Diamant especially, I'll just say, uh, he um, he basically is kind of like a tank, almost like a general, but he can move farther. He's got high speed, uh, or at least mine did, so you don't have to worry about him like being doubled all the time. Um, high HP, high dexterity, but also his like ad- his promoted class skill is Soul, which if you play Fire Emblem, you know that Soul is basically they have a chance to heal themselves. So he's just kind of like this self-healing yes. tank, just blitzing down the battlefield, throwing tomahawks everywhere. And Alchrist, um, my Alchrist had a, he ended up with 40, I think like 42 dexterity, what the which fuck? means he, he had like a 42% chance of, which means he critical a lot, but also means, no, not critical, but he did critical a lot, but uh, he, he had a 42% chance of activating Luna, which mm-hmm. if you play Fire Emblem, you know, that ignores defense. Mm-hmm. So he was just like sniping everyone, even if they had high defense as an archer. That's so funny. <laughs> so those two people were very good for me. I will say that right now, I, I haven't played enough to really get in the weeds of like the skill system in the game. So sometimes I'll be in a battle and like three things will pop up on the UI in the upper left. And I'm like, I don't know exactly what's triggering all those, but I bet it's good. And usually I get into Fire Emblem games enough where eventually I'll be able to distill all of that down and know exactly what they all are and coming from. So I'm glad that the game, I'd rather have it this way and just have you learn by doing rather than the game like slowly doling it out with a bunch of t- tiny incremental tutorials. So there, of course, are tutorials uh, that are kind of like, yeah, yeah, I know how Fire Emblem works, but I am it. I, I don't feel like it's too long in the tooth in the beginning. Yeah, you kind of get in the action later right in the game. Later in the game, you, what ends up happening is each character has their own like inherent skill that's like literally unique to that character. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Fram's skill is that she gets more of uh, evasion during while she, she's close to a leer. Um, but um, each character has their skill, and then like every promoted class has a unit has a skill, and then of course which emblem you have engaged will add like a skill or two. And then there's systems later in the game you can actually like learn emblem skills inherently and josh was talking about maddening mode earlier and these are actually the sorts of things like in maddening mode you have to pay attention to where it's like i really want these two characters to be uh close to each other because they get like an additional five percent chance of critical or whatever that, that's actually that's really important it. that's really yeah. important. <laughs> in, the, in the, the highest difficulty yeah uh once one skill uh alfred if he waits without using without doing anything he gets plus two strength yeah. So I imagine that's actually probably really useful if it's like, rather than having Alfred attack somebody, maybe if you just put him in a position where he just waits and he killer. gets attacked. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, cause he gets that plus two strength if he does it. But yeah, those sorts of, so I, I didn't play engage on maddening, just didn't have time. Um, I might in the future. Yeah, but I, I, did I play, might do it on like a second playthrough. I usually do yeah, like you kind of want to get familiar. For me, I kind of want to get familiar with like the game sure. first rather than doing maddening from the get-go props to those who do do maddening from yeah the my friend's a legend dude he's his own. Uh, my friend's a legend. but um but yeah those are the sorts of things that you really have to pay attention to and i played uh three houses on maddening and i remember like having like uh leany and a bunch of characters uh with sort of those sorts of skills just kind of balling up because they gained not like maddening they... on uh three houses usually usually i have an okay time but that maddening in three houses not like especially like the when you when the three Faction fight, oh. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. Punch you in the mouth. Uh-huh. 
correct. Yeah. And then this is me being ignorant again. I'm also not quite clear yet what bonus you get from an emblem if you're not in the engage mode, if you're just in passive mode. Do you get a small bonus when you have an emblem, but not you haven't triggered the, the meter yet? One second. Let me check something here. What do you mean? Like, you, do you get like a bonus just having an, uh, an emblem with you? Yeah. Yeah, you, you get uh, something. So it's, right. not, it's not like the bonuses when an when uh, uh, emblem is with you. Like, well, synced you know, and engaged. Yeah. You, you don't, you, some of them are, are just like engage exclusives. Yeah. You do get a little bit. Uh, yeah. Like, for example, for Marth, he has a skill, perceptive skill when synced. If your unit initiates combat, grants avoid plus 15. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Um, and then, like, divine speed with Marth. When engaged, unit performs an extra attack at fifty percent damage. Which, if you've engaged with Marth, you've noticed you get like you do get that extra attack in. Yep. So, yeah. So I think I'll need to dive into this skill system and know exactly which ones are tied to the emblems and only activate in the uh, the paired mode or in the synced mode. Adam, I, I keep on thinking about my time with uh, lunatic on on, on fates or not on, on uh, conquest. <laughs> I, yep. Yep. <laughs> Do you, oh. do you remember that? Oh, what was Takumi, the archer? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. There's that one level. I think it was like almost like the final level in one of the routes where Takumi just has like this super big giant magic bow and he's just like blisting, blasting you from afar. And it's just like, <laughs> stop it, Takumi. You piece of shit. Man, what a scumbag. <laughs> I remember that, that when did, I did that game had teeth. Oh my god! <laughs> I was fighting for when, my life every single stage. When I did maddening mode on three houses, um, which of course was a post-launch update yeah. back then, uh, I believe I did it on the Black Lions route, which is Black either the Lions. best because it's or, or sorry, uh, <laughs> You're sorry Black up. Black yeah. Eagles, the Edel Guards route, um, and it was either the best idea because it's one like a few chapters shorter or worse because you don't get as much training. <laughs> I don't know quite, but I remember at the very end. Uh, you you fight the boss of that game, which uh, of that route, which is um, pretty difficult even on regular mode. And I had Hanneman with me, or whatever the name of that the the male professor, the male teacher is. Um, yeah, Hanneman. And, and I only won because I remembered you could shove, and I just I was like, oh shit! <laughs> I, I I was like, this character can't is one you one space like short of being able to do what they need oh wait mm -hmm. epiphany shove <laughs> that i want i don't know like hanneman you rock star you gave someone a push i don't even remember what it was but uh maddening mode i really enjoyed it in that game so uh, like like josh said i might or I, like adam said both of you said um i might uh if i enjoy my first playthrough i'm doing hard classic uh, to me that feels like more like most prototypical fire emblem uh and if i really enjoy my first playthrough i could see myself um playing it again on maddening and i'm actually really kind of glad that it's not branching Branching is kind of fun. I wouldn't want to see it go away forever, but I do kind of like where it's just, okay, here's a game with just a straight chapter to chapter progression, like the old days or whatever, um, and not having to feel obligated to be like, all right, I've seen three of four routes, got to do that last one or, or, or something like that. Uh, one thing that I... Make, do you think they'll make a, a Musou spinoff of this game? Um, highly. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they, they, like they, they did that for three houses. Yeah, I, I'm sure of it. I mean... Isn't this code developed by Koei as well? This Actually, I don't no. think so. No, this game no? is all intelligent systems. Yeah, all intelligent systems. It's, it's not. It's not even. It's not even the Dynasty version. It's on Unity. Yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you go to the if you go to the uh, f the the title screen of this game, it just says like all rights reserved Nintendo Intelligent Systems. It doesn't say anything about Koei, and I'm pretty sure the credits didn't say anything. So I wonder if the next Fire Emblem will be a never uh, co joint with uh, mm -hmm. like Koei. It would make sense because that um, means they'll be able to get them out like quicker. I'd imagine. I wonder right. if Intelligent I Systems right. is working. I wonder if I wonder if the other half of Intelligent Systems is working on the next Paper Mario. Hmm. Well, I just hope they don't bring that system back from the Shadow Dragon and was it Mystery <laughs> Emblem remake, the one where you had to kill your party members to access the Gaiden chapters. You're so good. <laughs> it's the worst I'm... thing they ever implemented. I don't know why, because I was a big Fire Emblem fan ever since I started releasing in the U.S., starting with the Game Boy game, so I'm a normie. But then, like, that first DS game, the uh, because it had that system and it had, like, a terrible art style, um, was where I fell off. And then I didn't come back on to the well, bandwagon or whatever. Die in the first place. Uh, <laughs> until uh, the three, yeah, three houses. Well, until the Shadow Dragon remake. That's when the series went dormant, right? Remember when Nintendo 
re-released the original Fire Emblem on mm-hmm. Switch for like for four time. months, yeah. and then delisted it. Just that like was... what they did with uh, just like what they did with that Mario collection. And yeah. and didn't you write an op-ed on that that was like, "This is stupid." Yeah, I was like why? <laughs> like, I sure I know the 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 like the margin of people who are actively interested in trying out the very first Fire Emblem game is probably not huge. But like you're literally delisting your own property for like artificial scarcity. Like just I guess it was a tactic at the time to get people to buy it, even if they weren't interested in it because they Everyone knew it was going Solo. away. And, and it's just I, like I, I didn't buy it. And I didn't buy the Mario Club. I'm like I'm not buying into this shit. I, I yeah. forget, I'm not supporting this. Like uh, I, I, I found it really interesting to revisit. This is the original game, and it had of course like the emulation like save states and whatnot too but it's just kind of like man that that soured me really yeah it was it was it was a bad time i remember when people were terrified they were going to do something similar for uh like zelda's anniversary and then they just ended up doing nothing major for its anniversary awesome I actually thought, like, so I found an, uh, a feature from December 2020 where Adam said, Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon, and the Blade of Light is a nice offering, but its limited release is silly. And I thought you were more toothed uh, than that because it was more than silly. It's just frankly dumb. <laughs> but I don't know. Like I guess that, that, that conversation was from late 2020, and it's still dumb now. Uh, the only thing about Engage that I don't think we've talked about yet, at least on this podcast, is Somniel. Different coverage from different outlets have covered Somniel differently because I know there, it's pretty uh, commonplace to hear like Three Houses is good or great, but the uh, but the monastery gets old. So Somniel is kind of offering and sitting in that same space, but it works differently because it's mostly optional. If you are, uh, this is a question I guess I'll point to it to Adam. If you're in a place where you thought the monastery got old. Is Somniel less intrusive? Yes, because all, so like the first couple of levels in Fire Emblem Engage, I kind of oh, well, I actually did literally make a checklist. Like, here's all the things you can do in between each battle. Like, you can go to the arena, you can check on your pets, you can like pick up items, you can do the strength training, you can do the the uh, the cafeteria, you can go and polish your rings, you can feed Sami, you can eventually fish, you can eventually do a wyvern ride. Uh, you can go to bed and have a character wake you up, which is kind of weird. Um, yeah, that that portion is like well, that's that's like oh, it's so uh, bizarre. <laughs> yeah, okay, there's a system in the game. I think I thought I mentioned this earlier, where uh, you go to bed, you literally go up to your bed, and you click sleep, and then just randomly, one of your characters will be like, "Time to wake up, Divine Dragon," and you see like a like you just see like it's almost like the uh, the face rubbing. Only without the rubbing, where you just see like the front of their face, like wake up in, the, in your face as your character is waking up. Yeah, like and it does like this ASMR thing. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's it's kind of weird. <laughs> um. Anyways, uh, so the first couple of levels in the game, I was doing all that, and then I just sort of realized, not slowly, but actually quite suddenly, like a lot of this stuff doesn't really do anything. You get like a very slight bonus to a leer, though I guess in maddening mode, you'll take what you can get and you might do that every time. I, I, <laughs> uh, in I, maddening uh, mode, taking naps is required. <laughs> well, that's for I, the strength training, but... I, I appreciate that uh, there's these things called bond fragments, and sometimes, you know, when you talk to a character, they'll leave bond fragments. But if you're just like, say, fuck that, I just want to progress, like any bond fragments that you're missing from character interactions, they'll just give it to you straight up. Yeah, I like how they just tell you, like, you don't need to wander the battlefield and talk to them. Like, but anyways, like, for example, ring polishing. This is sort of, I've seen a lot of people kind of poke fun at this or even harshly criticize it before the game release because it's just like, what is what is this? You can polish a ring. What it actually does is if you have a character polish a ring, the bond between that character and that emblem will increase very slightly. That's That's the utility of it. But well, I not- eventually just decided this isn't worth it. Okay. Because you'll get but- plenty of bond otherwise. They think about it like this. You'll go to that screen, you'll see like the 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 faces, the smiley faces. Sometimes you will let that dip down and it'll go from green to yellow, and then they'll get sadder and sadder. And you're like, I can't let Sigurd be sad anymore. This is not a front to humanity. I need to polish his ring to turn that frown upside down. Let's put it in a think about it like that. Like Sigurd's been through, through uh, too much already, man. Like I said, just put the ring in the barbecue, it'll strengthen it up. 
but yeah, I guess I guess that's like all I really have to say about Engage for right now. I mean, I'll continue playing through it, you know, gradually. It's uh, you know, it, it gets the important thing right for me, which is gameplay, and I couldn't really ask for more. I think that's all I look for in a Fire Emblem game, to be honest. But it having a good story, it's a plus. Like most people didn't like Fates for the storyline. But it got at least carried by the gameplay if you're playing Conquest. So yeah, yeah. I mean that that's that that's the story of the Con- Conquest is like the, the Conquest storyline is like dog one, shit. One out of ten here. That's yeah, why, that's why it's I couldn't so trust the person. Bad. Like, if you told me that the same person wrote Deal Field, I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, that's right. <laughs> so you can't yeah. convince me to buy the game after playing that dog shit, right? But uh, you know, Dealfield did the same thing. I'm like, oh, actually, the story in Dealfield was all right. Like that, 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 that was actually pretty good at Dealfield. But yeah. and the, the gameplay was pretty solid too. So they, they got it figured out by Dealfield. But like sometimes, but yeah. Sorry, what was it? Bro? No, I, was, I was gonna say sometimes, like it's it's easier. I find myself being almost a little bit of a snob and being like. I don't play games for story. They're not any good unless they have good gameplay. But I did actually kind of really enjoy how Three Houses had like the different routes. And not only did the different routes have different perspectives, but they had like different focuses for their story. Like Claude's route was very like typical Fire Emblem, heroic versus the enemy. Kind of like not a lot of nuance. It's very straightforward and frank. Then you had... um, uh, Dimitri's, which was very like... uh, Dimitri's was a very personal story. There was a lot of like history to the characters almost like a little bit of a smaller scale then there's edelgards which of course kind of turns like the idea of what is the right and wrong thing to do protagonist antagonist on its head uh and then the last route i think was a little bit more throwaway uh but it, it actually provided a little bit of interesting like dynamic about like the sorts of stories fire emblem can tell and do i play fire emblem games for the story no but i actually kind of enjoyed that three houses had a little bit to chew on there in terms yeah, of like it's, it's why fine, it's fine it's fine if like a game has like a good story like awesome like more power mm-hmm. to them that makes it like more, like more pleasant to get through but mm-hmm. like in the end like but i think about games like if you have like a really good story but like it feels awful to play or i'm not really like just don't care about the gameplay chances are i'm not gonna like finish the game now on right. the flip side if you have like really really fun gameplay and i really enjoy just like the act of playing it I can forgive for a lot of things for it because if I just enjoy playing the video game, then sure, yeah, whatever. Who cares about like if the characters are bad or the story is bad? As long as I enjoy playing it, I think that to me, that's more important. But that's you know, that's just that's just me. That that doesn't apply to anyone else, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Well, if, like, if the story, I, know, like, I was just gonna say, um, like even people um, like you know praise the Telia saga like nonstop on how good the Ike <laughs> games are. There's still some issues with the storyline. Dude, the, the the story the story is fucking weird in older Fire Emblem games. There's a lot of incest undertones. <laughs> mm. Okay, well, okay, yeah, it's even more fucked uh-huh. up when we get into spoilers. Uh-huh. But, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm gonna stop it there, but yeah, it's it's it gets. Really, but I was just gonna say the Ike it's game. It's a consistent thing. Do you remember the blood pack? Yes. Yeah. That yeah, is yeah. one of the worst story reasonings <laughs> to like have you to fight against the Ike crew. It's like, hey, you signed this contract that if you don't fight against these guys, this entire place is gonna die from. Yeah, like... Fire Emblem Fire- Fire- is a series that's like not like known for like it like consistently good story. <laughs> I mean, people yeah, like always clear. praise like these games like like they had like the best story ever written. You know, it's like no, there there's some issues with older games too. You know, just a lot of them actually. I, I actually really that. enjoyed, uh, and we weren't podcast casting at the time of course because that was a long time ago but i really enjoyed path of radiance a lot more than radiant dawn because the story Mm -hmm. was a little bit more simple and straightforward uh it it did kind of give like a really like the ending of that game is very much there is going to be a sequel this is going to be followed up on as you heard that one heron dude slowly crawl through his text at the end of that game and then like i think the climactic of radiant dawn just got a little bit silly when you're going up the tower of the gods and things like that <laughs> where, it, where it started out as like this band of mercenaries fighting against these evil kingdoms like oh fire emblem and then it got really into like you are fighting on behalf of a god and and the fact that it escalated over two games and not one game i guess is gives it a little bit of a a little bit of a pass um but Anyways, I'm getting a little bit off topic there. No, I actually don't remember good. I, t- I spoke about this in a previous podcast. Um, one thing, we're not really talking about like the story itself, but one thing I kind of appreciated about Three Houses, probably more than any other game in the series, was that like each character had their own story. Like they came from somewhere and they all arrived at Garrigmach in a kind of a different fashion. 
And I like the support conversations in that game because you learned more about the characters, like where they came from, like their personal history, why they're there. And also it did like there was a, also a, a respectable amount of world building where it's like the different places in this world all had different histories and these are different events that have happened and affected the characters in different ways. And there's like different relationships between the characters that were all like uh, expanded upon in those support conversations. And this even led to every single character in Fire Emblem Three Houses has a paralogue battle that is sort of a culmination of their personal story. Some of the characters were paired, but like, you know, some conflict that you basically interacted with and, you know, kind of saw their story to fruition. And, you know, like I said, it kind of gave that that world building, those characters that cast you know, a little bit of substance. It was a little bit video gamey, yeah, but, you know, it, it gave each character a little bit of depth. Now, Engage doesn't have that. The paralogs in Engage are tied to the emblems, and they're they're basically trading away, like, this character building for nostalgia in that you there's literally 12 paralog battles in Engage that are the 12 emblems that are basically, remember this map from this game and remember this music? And you kind of replay out of nostalgia. And as someone who's played almost every game in the series, sure, it's really cool to see that. Like, oh, I remember this music. This, you know, this reminds me memories of Path of Radiance. And it, it, this is the map where the Grail mercenaries stay overnight in this fort early in the game or whatnot. But I do think it leaves the world and characters of Ilios and Gage a little bit less to work with because they don't have, you don't have to, there's, there's very, there's very little character and world building otherwise. Um, and again, like you guys are just talking about, I'm not saying that, you know, if the game doesn't have world building, it's garbage or, or whatever. I'm just saying, like, I appreciated that it was there in Three Houses, and I'm just a little bit disappointed that they yeah. just kind of cut back a lot on it. Yeah, it's so, totally fair. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think when you were playing Fire Emblem 4, I think a lot of, like, the backstories and a lot of more in-depth things was kind of told through, like, the official guidebooks. It's kind of like, and like how Final Fantasy did it with their like Ultimedia guides and stuff to explain more in detail on where to find this information. I think that's kind of like a thing with Japanese media back in the day. You just had to buy these like guidebooks if you want to know more about each character's backstory and lore, because the game obviously doesn't provide enough back in the old games. You don't know, worry when they, when they when they when don't worry, Chow. When they remake Fire Emblem Four, they're going to add support conversations. There, there, there's this thing called fanfiction.net, child. There, you there get is, all the backstory there is you want. Four conversations of Fire Emblem Four, but the thing there's is, you get all many. So, I know there's like not many specific. Talk, there's like specific conversations with specific characters on specific maps. But okay, here, here's a gameplay thing that will screw you over in Fire Emblem Four. If you miss the support conversation for the final battle with predestined couples. They will not become couples at the yep. at the fire. You don't start with the kids mm -hmm. in the oh, next what's, map. When I played Fire Emblem Four, what's the name of that wind mage that is like broken? I forget uh, his name. Seti or uh, or Levin. I think Seti. The, the, Seti, because I didn't get Seti. I got like the generic replacement for him because well, I didn't have the parent. And Seti what? is like. Oh, if you miss the if you miss the support conversation, then it's like, well, good luck. Oh, okay, I think his official name is set. It's said now, right? Yeah, I think it, it, it was Seti for the longest time in the fan translation, but then it was changed. To oh Seti. well, you know, you know, I remember our conversation a while back when we said uh, you should be able to play games not guides well for Fire Emblem Four. <laughs> oh yeah, so you know, I got you. this character. I got this like substitute character named Hawk, who is like a very generic look, but he actually was like a decent character. But apparently, Seti is completely broken and not getting him is uh -huh. not good. <laughs> Yeah. He is God tier. He basically yeah. has a tome that gives him 20 extra speed. Plus, he already has like 20 speed. So, and speed is capped out at 30 in that game. So, you basically have 40 base speed that you can't be hit. Uh, I think the only person that could kill, probably kill him is probably Ishtar. Mm hmm. Well, with that, I think we've kind of run the gamut of the different systems and Fire Emblem Engage. Uh, so I know this has kind of been three weeks running for talking about this game, but obviously it's been a kind of a major release for the for the month. And every time we talk about it or post about it, there seems to be a lot of discussion and fervently about it. It's really nice to be able to talk about it at a full, you know, at a full cadence without any restrictions on preview or embargo. Obviously, me and Josh and potentially others will continue to play through it. So it's there is likely chance that it will show up on future podcasts, but just likely as not our headliner. Um, of course, we kicked off this discussion by saying that Adam, of course, wrote his review and it's up on the site. So if you want to hear basically the things that Adam said in written form, they are up on the site as the Fire Emblem Engage review on rpgsite.net.
And then we're still technically going through uh, a few previews that have gone up on the site. And the one that I brought up quickly earlier and set aside, we're going to return to here. And that is a preview that James put up for the upcoming Wo Long Fallen Dynasty, which is coming out in early March, being developed by the uh, the Neo team. So I'll hand the uh, discussion over here uh, to James, because I actually didn't realize until enough was happening in the last week that I didn't realize that James had code for this and was playing it. Uh, so uh, when this came up on the site, it was a bit of a surprise, like, oh, we have a preview for this game coming out. That's fun. So, James, uh, Wo Long Fallen Dynasty. Uh, so it's it's interesting because I don't think I've actually gotten code for a game this early, because to be clear, they sent us a. Uh, preview code but it's just the full game so i huh. like like i you can't talk ab- yeah i i can't talk about anything besides like the first two levels because that's the uh, extent of the uh, preview embargo but i can i mean there's nothing saying i can't like like disclose that i have seen the credits i've beaten the game so i mean <laughs> um only, yeah. only two months ahead of time I mean, I mean that's a luxury we don't often get normally we're under the gun to cover a game like this since uh, the preview's out there and you can kind of see what I thought of the uh, first two levels and I guess some of the gameplay mechanics are like, they don't really depend on which levels they're in. Um, I guess I'll take a, take a, the situation to explain how when it comes to pre-release code like this, sometimes it's easy to forget that not, not nec- like sometimes what you're playing isn't necessarily finished. Because mm-hmm. uh, when I beat the game, it the state of the PC port was uh, 60 FPS capped. And even if you tried running it in 4K, it was like capped at like 1440p. Um, that's no longer the case because just about like a day and a half ago, I randomly got a patch to the uh, game because I still hadn't installed because I'm doing post game stuff, which they've announced was post game stuff. So I can say that there's post game stuff. Um, and the PC port looks, runs, and plays better now. So it's just kind of interesting, because I don't, like, even when I've, like, obviously played review copies, like, this is uh, pretty unique in the sense that there's just, like... There's clearly not optimized yet. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I, yeah I, would imagine, playing, uh... I would imagine uh, Neo had, both Neo games had, you know, considerable amount of DLC. I would assume Wolong, I don't know if they've announced any, will have some. I they... Don't they mm, I don't think so. Really? I don't, not, yeah. like, they're, they're making, like, pre-order items, but uh, I'm not, I'm not I sure about that. I think they've announced DLC. Have they? Yeah. I think I... they've announced DLC, because you can buy a deluxe edition, can't you? I don't know. I, just... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, quick, someone look up if it has a deluxe edition and what it says it comes <laughs> with. Because I know an answer to this, but I can't exact. If it's not announced yet, I can't exactly say. Okay, well, I, I, I guess the, 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 the answer is even in that, you know. They they uh, did upgrade. Uh, there is a season pass that is going to get three releases. Um, they've even titled these. It's on the Steam page. Okay, uh, okay, yeah, so there is going to be a season pass. Because I was going to say that at, on the title screen, it says purchase season pass now. Or there's there's a podcast that we just break embargoes behind everyone's backs. No, it's but this is no, but this is on the um the yeah, same page. Yeah, I'm, just, so I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just joking because I'm not a lot. Well, but uh, anyways, it. having three different DLC packs is very that's what that's exactly what they did for both Neo games. So I'm not surprised that it's the same here. Yeah, I remember for uh, both Neo one and two. So I assume it's going to be something similar here. I don't know for certain. Uh, it's funny how like. I guess spoilers for the ending of Neo 2. It's like, oh, by the way, here's a tie-in directly to Neo 1, but not the base game. Here's this uh and like this uh like villain from the DLC that you surely played, right? Yeah, yep, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the DLC implementation in Neo 2 was like I kept coming back to play it, which I don't always do. And then of course, uh, the the kind of the point of comparison was Stranger of Paradise, how its DLC implementation was different and odd and turned a lot of people off. So I think that if you basically the precedent and pedigree is there, that if Wo Long is something that a person plays and really adheres to and thinks it's really good, then the DLC should hopefully be more of the same and give, you know, be good support for the game post launch. And it looks like they've got it scheduled basically throughout 2023. Um, 
uh, they've got one slated for June, one slated for September, one slated for December. So might be the sort of thing where we end up talking about this game at a kind of a pretty regular cadence throughout the year if it's something that we really uh, think pretty highly about. Yeah, yeah. I don't know when the actual review embargo is for. Uh, That's Wolong. always fun. I, I've been yeah. there. <laughs> where it's like I, I, I beat this game. I have thoughts, but I I won't be able to share them for probably well, almost definitely at least another month. I did all Xenoblade 3 for me. Like, I just, I, I had a preview embargo, yeah. but I didn't know the review embargo. What would happen I, if there was a Japanese release, like, that's ahead of the American release? It's like, oh, yeah, it's out in Japan, so I can talk about this stuff, but I'm still under embargo from the review or something. Well, that, well, that still just... happens sometimes. That still happens sometimes. I won't say anything specific, because I'll be breaking embargo, but in Fire Emblem, there are a couple of characters that I cannot say join your team. But if really? you <laughs> pay attention to the very first cutscene of the game, it's pretty yeah. evident that they do join your team. What? That's and crazy. Also, like the Japanese Twitter account just literally says, here's a character that can join your team. But I in cannot case, say it. In that case, it, it, it's like people say where it's like there's some embargoes where it's like you can you can basically ignore them. And I think that right. would fall under one. I, 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 I love I love the Japanese t- Twitter uh, shit because like according to the Japanese Twitter from this game, you know. Not my impressions. It's uh-huh. According to this account, that's right. I'm just reading the internet. <laughs> that's all I'm doing. <laughs> that's right. Oh, but man. in in the case that Chow was talking about, it'd be like for like near Automata, where it's like you have a review embargo, yeah. but it's been out in English for a month. It's like okay. I remember like uh, when I was playing through near Automata's uh, Japanese release, I actually got like a uh, DM from the person that did the uh, GameSpot review being like, are you breaking the bargain? It's like, no, I'm playing the Japanese version. <laughs> uh, that's that the, yeah, we, time. We, we had to like switch reviewers for that here. And like, I think Zach was uh, like lined up to review it. But then like since the, the English release and the code for it was so not until English launch, I was like, I don't know. I like Nier. I'm just playing the Japanese release, you know? So they're like, well, fuck you. You're rewriting the review now. I'm like, all right, I guess. <laughs> so that's how it goes. Yep. <laughs> so James obviously has wrote up his preview for Wallong Fallen Dynasty uh, up on the site. And then on the news front, this is pretty uh, minor, but there was also a release from Koei Tecmo, a, a story trailer for the game. So it's pretty meaty. Um, it's got a lot of mostly CG cutscenes and not a lot of straight gameplay, though. It does have some uh, up on the site as well for, for that game, which is uh, coming out March 3rd. So right in the middle of I'm very excited else for it. I, I, I'm ready to love it. I'm ready to love it. Yeah, I'm for some reason, I'm not like I loved Neo 2. This game, I just I think I just it's too far away and there's too many games between now yeah. and then for me to really get like super amped for it. But I think once I get Fire Emblem behind me or Octopath 2 or some of the other February releases and then this is next on the docket, I think I'll really start to feel that energy I, for it. I, I, I think like I come with like in a weird like angle to it because for me, like a lot of the appeal for it is like how did like the envision like the three kingdoms in this game? Because I, I really love the three kingdoms era. And I'm stuff, looking so. forward to kind of learning some of that stuff because I have not really been exposed to a lot of that. Uh... It's it's funny how many people like learn about that era because of Dynasty Warriors because they play the same fucking campaigns across each game. It's like, yep, I know yep. about the Yellow Turban Rebellion. I'm very familiar. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think that actually kind of covers for all of the uh, article shout outs that we were doing. So we kind of combined both our article shout outs and some of our early games talk sections, since obviously we wrote an article up on Family Engage and on Wolong as Adam and James respectively played through uh, those games. So Fire Emblem Engage, of course, released yesterday at the time of recording and Wolong. We won't be able to look at it again until it releases in about a month and a week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A month and a half, basically. <laughs> right. And then I guess I get to, before we go into the, the news section here, I get to kind of talk about something a little bit here that might not quite be topical, but it's what I played in the last week. So this will just be a little 10 minute section here or so. Uh, last week I played Soul Hackers 2. I wanted to basically cover it because it was a game that kind of fell through the cracks on my time last week. And then I listened back to the podcast and I actually kind of felt like, man, I kind of was really sour on this game and I felt I didn't feel good about it. Uh, you yeah, want to be honest. I, you know, like, like I, I didn't feel good about it after I came out of it. I'm like, yeah, it was, it was an RPG that I played, I guess. Yeah. And I listened back to it. I'm like, well, I was honest, but man, that wasn't fun listening to. It's not, it's not fun listening to someone 
say that they don't mm-hmm. like a thing, but it, even if it is honest, so you kind of understand it. But luckily, I had a little bit of time. I I had clocked Soul Hackers two, and I had a few days. And I'm like, you know, what's a game that came out last last year that apparently isn't too long and apparently is not terrible. <laughs> High, high praise, mm-hmm. I know. That is Valkyrie Elysium. So that game released uh, in November, I believe, or one one month for console, one month for PC, whatever. Like it's on Steam now. PS, PlayStation, and like November. Yeah. In Steam or something. I don't know. So I went to go play Valkyrie Elysium mainly uh, because I don't have a history with the Valkyrie Profile series or IP or anything. I've seen Adam play it and talk about Valkyrie Profile a lot. Um, I guess I did play the GBA game or whatever. Uh, but I played DS this game. Main- it's pretty good. Oh, is it DS? Yeah, Covenant of the Plume. Um, mm-hmm. I'll need to beat the first so, two. So it's uh, I uh, it's not it's not a great impression where like I'm gonna play this game because I hear it is short. But actually, it is kind of short, and I kind of appreciated it. <laughs> a good but, valid reason. Uh-huh. Yeah, it but actually, so so I played. Definitely played some games just because they're short. Because I wanted to play something, and I didn't want to like uh, spend. Uh, like a uh, hundred hours playing it. That's the main reason I played uh, the Legend of Nuyuta last year. It's like I want to play something. I don't want to. Hero Two is going to be like a hundred hours. I need to play something shorter first. <laughs> so b- without uh, bearing the lead too much more, Valkyrie Elysium I actually quite enjoyed a lot. I kind of wish I played it first before Soul Hackers. Uh, <laughs> I it feels like a PS3 game in like the best possible ways. So this is obviously a, an action RPG set in the Valkyrie profile IP, if not in the direct series. Um, if it has, a, it's a game that is very arcadey in nature. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of the buzzwords of like ex, of a lot of current RPGs, or it's not open world. It's it's very much designed as like a almost like you're you're picking missions out of a level select. Basically, you have a hub world and you have like side quests. And but you the fact that it divides it's um, actually talking about Neo. It's actually kind of similar where it kind of shows you a map of the area and says, here are the missions that take place in this area. You have a main quest here. You might have a few side quests. You might have a few character quests. And I just kind of enjoy the way that it's it's not afraid to be a video game where it breaks immersion, so to speak, where it's like, okay, I'm playing level one or I'm playing level four. Here's a side quest that takes place in the same region as level four or things like that. It, and there, there's something to say for something about Elden Ring where everything is like diegetic and combined into like this immersive, real open thing. But I actually do kind of enjoy that this kind this game kind of pairs it back and it's not an open world because it doesn't want to be. Um, and it, it's a little bit more bite sized. I think if you play this game on a portable system or on a Steam Deck, it doesn't run great on Steam Deck, but it does run. Um, it's actually kind of fun to have like these. Uh, I won't say bite sized because some of the levels are pretty meaty, but they're but the fact that they're diluted down into like a specific level where it's like this level will take you 25 minutes to 40 minutes to, to clear if you're if you're exhaustive or this side quest will take five minutes it's in the same area and you get a little bonus for doing it if you want to do it um the main the main crux of the combat here and i don't play a ton of action games so i'm not going to be able to like draw comparisons to anything like bayonet or devil may cry but you have basically a six weapon types i think four are required and two are optional and you have something I, th- I think it's five total element types and every enemy is weak to like both an element and a weapon so there's a little bit of rock paper scissors where if you're fighting a spirit enemy it's highly suggested to use the double-sided spear because that's what they're weak to and then each enemy is very clearly marked as what element they're weak to you don't have to uh adhere to that but it makes your job a lot easier and i played on normal and i'm guessing if you play on hard which i know adam did um you have to be a little bit more diligent about specifically swapping out to the weakness rather than just using your favorite weapon but the the, the setup is very straightforward very easy to understand and the, you're they're able to modulate it in ways that are quite interesting where you might have like a bunch of small enemies that are weak to fire, but then there's like a mini boss in the back that's weak to holy. And it's like, all right, I can summon my fire I hear and yar, and I'm not gonna pronounce that right, to basically help focus on the little guys while I focus on the big guy. Or you can just say like, I'm gonna focus on the big guy first because I know he's gonna drop a lot, a lot of health orbs and then take out the trash. Or you can focus out the trash. Like the, I, I kind of was changing my, not just my weapons or my elements, but my literally my approach as each battle yeah, there's a lot of mobs in that unbearable. game where you literally have to decide decide okay who do i take out first yeah. and oftentimes i'd like to take out those squid things because they were annoying as heck <laughs> the, the tr- charybdis or whatever uh yeah i hated those um and it's actually like 
And I remember when Josh was first describing this game, um, because he was on the cover it as a, in a review front, how the Ein Harry are were basically like abilities that you summon them, they do like a single attack, and then they stick around for a while. They might do might do a, f- a few more attacks if you have them set for long duration. But it was actually kind of I enjoyed their implementation in this game. Now I'm coming from a place where I don't have the perspective of saying, well, this is how they worked in Valkyrie Profile. So I'm ignorant there. And maybe there's a case where ignorance is, is bliss, where like I don't know like the other way to implement them. But just as someone who was a novice to the IP and doesn't have that i kind of enjoyed how they felt like you have both on your right bumper you have your iron hair yard and then on your right trigger at least on the default controls you've got your spells your divine arts and i really enjoyed just the interplay between them where it's like if you summon taika who is the fire mage iron hair yard then if you cast your fire spell you, you throw two fireballs instead of one so they can synergize like that or you can have it where you don't want to th- specialize completely in fire maybe you summon taika because there are some mobs around weak to fire but i am going to use the lightning spell because there's another character weak to lightning on the field so you can kind of switch around and mix and match and i was just really enjoying the flow of it it helps that i was playing on pc so that the um the frame rate stayed nice and fluid i, I assume this game does fine on, on playstation yeah, as well it's, it's fine on yeah, ps5 yeah. Yeah. yeah but just in general the combat felt fluid and fun there was a few like all of my c- concerns with this game were like really quite nitpicks. Like for instance, on the Charybdis enemies, they're quite tall. So when you get in and just start wailing at them in close range, their health bar, which sits above their head, gets <laughs> off the screen. So I'm like, yeah. I don't know how weak this character is. The 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 or this enemy is. They're gonna come out of their stun phase soon. I'm gonna assume that I'm gonna be able to finish off their he- health pool before they die, uh, before they unstun but i don't know for certain because like, you can't like manually pull back the camera you just can literally run away and so that their health bar like comes into view again so that was a bit silly um and then there might be a, some ways to mess with the toggles in the settings where this isn't quite uh an issue but i was having issue with the lock on like the, it, the game tries to do this thing where it like auto targets what it thinks is your most appropriate enemy based on the I way i think your you can toggle going. that on the options Okay, because I was having well, a few instances. Fifty like percent sure. I was having a few instances where I was like, "All right, I want to focus on this," but because the camera would swing where that character would right. get off screen momentarily, the game would auto be like, "Okay, you're targeting this now," and I'm like, "Wait a minute, that, that enemy that you're now targeting is weak to a different thing, and I don't have, I'm not yeah. ready for that." Uh, where's that enemy I was focusing on? Oh, there mm-hmm. they are. And then refocus. But even then, that happened like once every fourth battle, and usually it was something that I could fix in like. A, qu- a quick a couple button presses like press down on the right stick to retarget what i want and like i said if, if i sp- spent 30 seconds in the menu i could probably tweak the the auto targeting settings to be a little bit more to my to my um liking uh this is one of those games that we we're talking about fire emblem where this game does have a story and it has a fair amount of dialogue um and i was enjoying it at a high level like just the general flow of the story i thought was fine but i didn't feel compelled enough to really dig into it i know when adam was covering this game uh, on a podcast, or maybe it was James, or maybe it was both of you, how the Ein Harriar stories, most of them, they each have like a few side quests, but a lot of their background is sequestered away into like audio logs in the menu. And it's like, I didn't feel compelled enough to sit in the menu and listen to that. I'm sure it was fine. Exactly. And I I enjoyed like the characters. They each do have a nice... Uh, I, I am glad that the Ein Harriar aren't just elemental summons like they each do have a story and they behave a bit differently in different dispositions but the amount of flavor that i got in the main story as you're introduced and you unlock them was was enough for me i didn't feel compelled to like really dive deep and to me on a very gameplay focus i really enjoyed using christopher the like the holy or light element summon so i did heal yeah so i did her (laughs) side quest because it powers her up and then like um uh what's his name not sets her the ice bow mage cypher sizer cypher cypher yeah. yeah so i didn't use him very much so i didn't you do his side quest very much even though i'm sure like narrative wise they're fine uh then the game does this thing where at the very end of the game uh especially if you go for the quote-unquote true ending it does the same thing that i know valkyrie profile did even though i never played it which i almost didn't feel was earned like it was kind <laughs> of a very it was kind of a very like oh of course they went here but I, I didn't like it didn't have enough build up. It didn't feel natural uh, with this uh, Alphod character. Um, Armand. 
Armand. Yeah, Armand. Uh, he, I do like his English. I do like the English voice acting in this game a lot. I actually looked up who the voice of Valkyrie was in this one because I thought she did a really great job. Uh, Armand doesn't have has a lot the same of voice as Noah. Yeah, Absolutely. and I thought he did a yeah, and I thought he did a good job as well. So I thought the English voice acting was good. The story was fine. I enjoyed it, but I didn't feel compelled to like dig into it. I thought the gameplay. I don't have like the pedigree or the history to, to talk at length or with a lot of like expertise about action games. But I, I just enjoyed it. I thought it had a lot of good flow. I thought it had a, I, the, the different weapon types all feel different to use. And a lot of times I found myself preferring a weapon, even if it wasn't the most ideal one, uh, just because I like the, 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 the kit better. The, and yeah. I do like I did like how you progressed and unlocked abilities through the um, the progression systems all synergize together pretty well uh, with the way that you unlock your your like movement abilities or your your auto iron harrier summons or even just like the new combos on the weapons um i think the game could probably uh have had a little bit more efficiency in the way it, it doles out currency like you you kill enemies and it's just like you got 100 magic gems and 200 yellow souls and 50 uh violet gems and i just felt like i don't know what these are but i just know I, I need a bunch of these to upgrade my stuff and then as you do quests from the map it shows you which gems and souls you're going to get from each mission and I, I felt like maybe that could have done a pass and didn't need to be quite as complicated as it was um or maybe they could have had a little bit of efficiency and uh, players love multiple currencies yeah uh <laughs> but so I just enjoyed this game a lot, and it's a sort of game where it's like it. I'm it kind of. I, it took me 15 hours to beat it, so it was a little bit shorter. I didn't. Do, I didn't exhaust it, um, but I did like a fair amount. I did more. I did like two thirds of the side quests. I unlocked all the weapons and tiered them all up completely. So it's not like I skimped on that stuff. But it's a sort of game where if you if you've got a uh, some time and you've you like the IP or you just like action RPGs in general, if you miss the bygone era of the PS3, which sounds silly to say, but uh, that's kind of what it felt like. It felt like a PS3 action game that would have been better received for at least, uh, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And I'm really glad that I took the time to play it and squeezed it in before uh, I actually didn't quite get as far and found them engaged last night as I wanted to because I was finishing uh, Valkyrie Elysium up. And I really enjoyed yeah. my time with it. It's, it's, it's a fun game to play. Like, I know it gets a lot of shit, but I was like, no, uh, but it's fun to play. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly. I enjoyed playing it. Um, the 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 two DLC add-ons are very like gameplay focused. Like Hilda's Vengeance, uh, I dipped my toes into it for like five minutes, and like I said, I'm playing this game for the gameplay, anyways. So you might think, well, that's it, right up your alley. But you're just going through like the same maps and enemies, just with a different kit again. I'm like, ah, I've, I've seen enough of this in the base game. I don't, I don't need to see this again. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, I didn't play it, but Adam described the Seraphic Gate to me a little bit, and um, it's just more combat focused stuff. So if, if you really, really dig into it and you really like that stuff, it's cool that they have the option. But I'm like, eh, I don't need to see that. Um, I got what I wanted out of it, and it was a really good time and I, I kind of suggest if it fell through the radar or through the cracks or under the radar for you last year and you like action games or you like just kind of the the, the setting or the feel of it it's it's a good thing to it's i'd suggest this one over soul hackers too and i guess comparing those games like that isn't quite fair i'm only doing it because i played them back to back just... <laughs> yeah but uh i enjoyed one greatly more than the other all right and with that We'll go into the news section, I believe. I think we've covered all the games we've been playing and all of the features up on the site. Uh, this week is a little bit heavier on news than last week, and we're going to start out with what Josh introduced in Coily, in a way, an hour and 50 minutes ago. And that is, it is mid-January, and this is when the annual Grand Blue Fantasy Fest was delayed to, or at least not delayed to, but they held it in January instead of December this year. And the ever persistent question is the status of Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, which is slated to come out in 2023. And I will hand this over to either Josh or Chow or both of them, because I think they're more uh, on the pulse of this game than I am. So what did we see from Grand Blue Fantasy Relink uh, this year at Grand Blue Fantasy Fest? They showed us a, a trailer that they dubbed or they, they titled it the second trailer for this game. Uh, I don't know why, but they sure called it the second trailer for this game. Well, they don't want to be associated with Platinum Games in any ways. They even went back to remove all the trailers that they made with Platinum Games back then. Uh, Isn't that yeah. bizarre? It's like you can't uh, even find that video of that boss fight back from back in the day. Which... I mean, I'm sure someone captured it. I know, uh, but but officially, they don't want to be associated with no, that. Yeah, sure, nothing happened behind the scenes. Nothing bad happened behind the scenes, of course. There's... I'm sure. 
But you know, we got a new trailer. Um, the 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 main details that that we got out of it, uh, just that straight up front. Uh, it still says 2023 at the end of that trailer uh, worldwide. Uh, so there's no release still for this game. So it's still a gamble whether it actually releases this year or not. Um, they confirmed that Narmaya is a playable character in it. There's um, Yoda. Um, there's Yoda too. They, they they showed off Yoda last time. Did they? they? Uh, yeah, they they confirmed Yoda last time. Um, okay. Uh, I saw some people. Time. I saw some people reporting that it was new, but it wasn't. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, they confirmed Yoda last time. We didn't see footage of Yoda, but they confirmed like in the art slide. Um, but yeah. So, but Nar- Narmaya is new to, for Wheeling. Yeah, um, you can't have you can't have a Grand Blue game without Narmaya. So I, I don't know anything about Grand Blue, but I know who Narmaya is. So I see, she'll sell copies. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the, for the right reasons, um, mm-hmm. they they introduced a new yes, yep. <laughs> um, the, they introduced a new antagonist, uh, Id. Uh, there's a new brand new game original character. Yeah, um, he's not in the mobile by, game. Yeah, voiced by Robbie yeah. Raven in English and Kenjiro Suda in Japanese. So, um, that's 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 deep. He looks cool, but you know, the, a lot of like the new trailer was like kind of stuff we've already seen before it's like yes it's a national rpg yes you'll be you can play up to the four people online and then they just you know the, i think the most interesting thing about the trailer honestly is like when it starts up it says the world of final fantasy and it like goes through the settings and transitions and like the environments fantasy. of that game like it looks really good like no lie, it's like it makes you want to like explore you said final fantasy you mean grand blue fantasy yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, like well, I didn't actually see Final Fantasy. Okay, well, the thing, was, is, uh, the thing is, Grand Blue funny. is built from a lot of X uh, Square Square Enix staff when when the game started. So they even I didn't even like, said Final Fantasy. I like but, I didn't even think about it. That's awesome. Uh, there's um, a lot of even reference to Final Fantasy if you play the mobile game. Yeah. So and, and then one of one of one of the new quote unquote gameplay things they showed off is like this game. Th- this will have like two assist modes. Like one, it's kind of like. What you're used to, like you've seen in Bayonetta, like it kind of does the same thing, right? Where there's one assist mode where if you just press the attack button again and again and again, it'll do the flashy combo. Um, you still you still have to like, you know, uh, do some stuff with it. Uh, the, the, and that assist mode, uh, whether it's like jumping or like uh, maneuvering around, but you and you still have to like perform the attacks themselves. But it'll do it'll heal automatically. It'll guard automatically. Doesn't Nier Automata have a mode like that? I think so too. Yeah. And then they have a full assist mode where it's like you can have the game play itself and all you have to do is move around. That's it. It's for so. story enjoyers. But the thing is that I'm worried about is that this game is like, what is the business model? Knowing side games, you know, they have to like, implement gotcha. And seeing how successful games like Genshin Impact is, they're probably like, oh, we're going to make a gotcha game. And now, so you do know they released uh, like little noah last year and that's just a normal ass game right yes but this is my child is so brain broken by anything like uh side games related that like if it's a side games it has to have a gotcha system it's like even the fucking fighting game has a gotcha system i mean yeah yeah like it's, it's, it's to some extent i get it but at the same time hopefully they don't have a gotcha system in this game just like be a normal fucking game please yeah that's what i, I hope for but you know a lot of companies are, are copying genshin because they're like oh look this game made like four billion dollars. I bet we could do the same too. No, but we're talking about side games here. Like they, they don't need to copy Genshin. They found their own success way before Genshin. Yeah, but and that's getting you know that's getting off the topic. Like like really like you know the, they showed like some gameplay demo demos of re- like obviously if you're attending Grand Blue Fest in person, you can play a demo uh, that they set up there. So you can get hands on it. You also got to win the lottery too. You get basically you get to the festival your ticket gets scanned and it, go- it goes in a raffle then you get to play it so you know, i didn't know about the lottery system yeah you don't actually get to play it just by just attending you also have to win the raffle oh, you have to, yeah you have to win the gotcha got it so, okay. so yeah so great a double gotcha awesome <laughs> um but um and then like you know in the actual streamers themselves they like had like a training dummy up to show off like some of the move sets you know it it, it doesn't look too different from when they last saw gameplay footage. Um, and then they shut off like, the full assist mode. But that's basically it for a relink. Like, that there's still no release date. They're still saying they're, they're still aiming to release it this year. And they keep, you know, saying, oh, sorry, it's taking so long. It's like, all right, I guess. Like, we've been through this song and dance multiple times. It's like, 
Uh, the, to me, I can't really get excited for this game until I actually like play it for myself now. I, I still feel that like the director is being spread out way too thin. He's taking on too many projects all at once, and and it feels like none of any of the projects is going anywhere. That's at least how I see Grand Blue for the last couple of years. It's like he's, he's the main director of the fighting game. He's the main director of the reeling. He's the main director of the mobile game. It's like they need they need more people, or at least you know, or something. You know, somehow the the the, the biggest winners out of all this was the fighting game yeah. players for 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 Grand Blue versus because they announced that they have they very clear if it was like a new game or like an expansion to Grand Blue Fantasy versus, but they announced Grand Blue Grand Blue Fantasy versus Rising, and that's you know going to have new stages, new characters. Um, you know, a new RP, uh, story for the RPG mode uh, that that original game had, and then most importantly, new everything because they had to remake it from the ground up. Yeah, mostly. Back. Yeah, yeah. Most importantly, you know, it's gonna finally gonna have rollback net code, which is what the Grand Blue Fantasy versus people wanted from day one, and it took you know quite yeah. some time to finally get to this point. But most <laughs> I, of all, I love. Also, I love it. on the uh, announcement uh, tweet. Uh, people did a. Uh, reverse card of the uh now iconic uh um upset emoji with uh one sunglasses and a thumbs up oh yeah that man of emoji it's really good and now unis is the only game that does not have rollback <laughs> and now it's the game being clowned on Rip. But, uh but yeah but they uh, they announced rollback netcode for um, grand blue fantasy versus rising they also confirmed crossplay with ps5 ps4 and steam which is you know very good i think fighting game fighting game should make that a standard to have a healthy community congratulations i will now buy your game yeah, so um, I, I, it's uh, it it it, it looks it looks pretty promising. Like it, it's like it, it is the big W that the Grand Blue Fantasy versus community has needed for a long while. So I, I kind of feel bad for the director now. He's getting clowned on by like the entire community back then, but he was just under NDA that they can't tell people that he was working on. But, I mean, I mean, the, the, despite that though, like I mean, the, the, they deliberately did not like put rollback in 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 the base game and they have a thousand revealed in the interview it's like oh you know we didn't think about it but you know you just you just can't do it now like it, to some extent it is kind of you know deserved because the, the way that, that 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 game played very poorly on online it did not feel good for 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 the western audience i think I, one of my favorite things is coming out of this is uh someone that isn't a grand blue fan like the fact that they outright said that one of the main reasons why they had a rollback was because of the international mm-hmm. response, which basically yeah. is code for the emojis worked. Bullying yeah. kind of works. Yeah, I kind, of, I kind of wish one of the people at the Grand Blue Fest had to like took out that bad emoji picture there during that. That's so sick. Also, oh. Chow, someone's already, I'm not sure if you, well, no, you don't use Twitter, so you didn't see. Uh, somebody already mm-hmm. did an edit of that one now iconic emoji thing, but uh, with the main character of uh, Unist. <laughs> uh, oh poor guy but yeah uh you know that's not really rpg related like at the end of the day but like in terms of like the grand blue fantasy mobile rpg the main one like is there anything like significant chow okay they... so for the mobile game okay so they've been the pa- okay so the mobile game has gone through some very weird things happen okay last year there was a huge drama where they gave out too much free shit thanks to a really broken lottery system and that kind of split the community apart and this year they've been like playing it very safe so we don't want to give out too much free stuff and then near the end of the year there is like all these like limited characters coming out non-stop and they're all like super broken and everyone's like kind of worried they're like is the game going end of service or something it's like why is all the like the angels are now playable now it's like there's a lot of like troublesome signs you know but at the same time, it's like, it, I mean, it's kind of getting there. I mean, there's eight years, you know, it's been long. Nine year anniversary is just two months away. I mean, not many gotcha games survived up to nine years, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but also not many gotcha games suddenly have like three or four different like spinoffs in development for like main consoles. Uh, I think I think people are like stuck in their own hole and are like overreacting because I don't think they're going to stop supporting it if they're still making like big budget games that also acts as uh, like advertising for the gotcha. Well, like if they end the game, I wouldn't be too surprised. I know it sounds like a huge money maker, but at the same time, like it's built on like very spaghetti code. The game is still a browser based gotcha game. And if they can kill it and then rebuild a new game and sell it, 
you know, side games done that before they did it with princess connect you know that's it's called redive for a reason because they're it's like a re you know like a reboot of the game right there used to be a princess connect game before princess connect redive you know they killed it and then they rebooted it with a new story and new new gameplay you know it's like grand blue 2 it's like it could mm-hmm. happen you know obviously a lot of people wouldn't be pleased to hear like something like that happening but you know knowing side games you know they've done something like this before you know well, when you say, oh, is the game dying? Like, I think of something like much different from, oh, they're making a new version of it. Like, but, I don't know. I, I don't play gotcha games, so maybe maybe my brain's wired differently there. Oh, but, probably for a good thing, you know. But yeah, I'm kind of like worried about like the power creep that's going on for the last couple of months. Uh, they actually made something very stupid back in Halloween. They made this one character that was so broken to the point that they're like, aren't you going to nerf this character? It's like, no. <laughs> because, like, back then they nerfed, like, this one character, like, immediately a day after. And then they gave out, like, actual, like, gotcha refunds. But they didn't nerf this one because I think they're just... It's, yeah, we're just going to roll with it. It's, like, it's kind of too late now. It's already been a month since that people found that character to be super broken. You know. Okay, the, 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 without getting too into the weeds here, do you see a successful year for Grand Blue Fantasy, the main game, right mm, now? That depends on how much content they can bring out. Because the game is in a very sad state for the last two years. There was hardly any content update, and a lot of the new event story was kind of terrible. There was one event that they did that takes place in uh, Isekai High School, sort of. That was so bad to the point that now they don't even want to be associated with that event. They were going nice. to use this event to promote like commercials and say that this event's part of the museum and stuff. But because the event is so god awful, they don't even want like anyone to talk about this event now. <laughs> like, cool. So there's a lot of it. It's been a bad year for for the game. Uh, a lot of like my friends even quit just because of how like sad the state of the game was. There was, but I don't know. Like this year could be something different. Um. What they added new for if you're into the mobile game, so the rat zodiac is getting her final uncap. So a lot of the times is like there's a uncap for a zodiac character that will come out like probably two years later from their original release. So you get to use them to like level 100, and she's like a very popular zodiac character. Um, Was it they have like a music album released for her? So if you buy the music album, you get a new skin as well. And some people speculate she might be the playable, the new playable character in the Grand Blue fighting game because there's a there's a new stage that was shown. It's a Zodiac stage, um, but because they always reuse the same background for all the Zodiacs, so you know you kind of have to speculate which Zodiac is going to be playable. On yeah, the I, I, I like how um, it, it's really funny. Like, uh, like you can de- de- definitely tell the difference between a person who plays Grand Blue who does it because when they like. Tease a new a new character for the upcoming expansion or new game to the fighting game, whatever. They like show a, a stage, and to me, it's just like, oh, there's a shrine and there's like snow. Like this looks cool to a grand blue player's mind. Like, oh my god, it's a zodiac. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> zodiac. Okay, sure. <laughs> sure. Okay, so uh, the red zodiac is my favorite. She's like this girl with like zero self esteem, mm-hmm. and she has like a part-time job as a dishwasher and for mm-hmm. some reason the rat zodiac chose her at as to be the guardian and she's like what the hell is this it's like i've signed up for save the world i'm just some like poor girl that doesn't know anything right and mm-hmm. so she has to like kind of like, hypnotize herself to have like this very cheerful over-the-top personality and the only way she could do it is with her headband and without the hairband she's back to her low esteem self it's i don't know she's extremely popular in the community uh, what was the other thing? Like people are speculating, it might be her or the sheep zodiac because the sheep zodiac is the first zodiac that was ever released for the Grand Blue franchise. So it's either one of the two. But okay, do you do you think they're gonna right? Now, uh, I never talk about the fighting game, but when you think about like the 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 playable cast that they've shown for reeling so far, to me as a as a person who knows Grand Blue mostly from the outside, but I know this game has a lot of like hundreds of characters with the cool designs. Like to me, I I feel kind of let roster they've shown from me. Like it's like the base OG Grand Blue crew, 
the four knights, knight dudes, which they seem cool, and like one or two like cool picks like Yoda and Narmaya, and that's it. Like I, I, I don't know, I don't know what like, the. It's kind of like the the curse of Gravity. It's like there's a lot of really cool character designs, and there's no way they can have hundreds of characters in that game. But I need something like super more like more super compelling than like just like the roster they've shown now. Is that I, like is that being greedy or is it just like no? It's not being greedy at all. But I feel like if they're gonna implement like the next set of characters that they would like to show off, it's probably related to like the angels, like the primarchs. Um, they're like extremely popular, and there is like one of the most popular event story in Grand Blue is there's this event called What Makes the Sky Blue, and it has to deal with all the angels and stuff. So. Um, I, I have a feeling that they would probably do something related to those angels from from those. Yeah, so like like Sand Alphon or something. Like yes. Like one of yeah. Basically, he starts out as this antagonist because he's been locked up in this celestial prison for for uh, I don't know like millennia or so, and he finally breaks out and he's like, "I'm fucking locked in here and I'm fucking pissed." And yeah, he eventually becomes a very popular character because, you know, they go through a redemption arc, they know what they did was fucking wrong, you know, stuff like that. And then during during like the sequel events, they introduce the antagonists for those events, like Belial and Bezabald, and you know how popular they are. Yeah, They're yeah. in the fighting game as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like you have to include them in some ways because you know they're like the most popular the fans. They're, 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 they're going to print money. I mean, on yes. top on top of the money that they'll print from just putting the like the Gotcha Game code I, items in the, in the copies. Uh, Belial is an excellent villain in my opinion. He's like this Joker that doesn't take himself seriously. I have a friend that hates him so much to the point that even when he rolled him in a Gotcha, consider how rare he is, he fucking like deleted him from his account because he hated him so much <laughs> as a villain. You know, it's like that's that's some dedication, you know. Not your game players. It's like they're oh. <laughs> imagine, okay. getting, imagine getting the most OP summon in the game and you fucking delete him from your roster because no. you hate him in the story. When are we gonna hear about Relink again, you think? Um, I don't think we'll hear about it until the summer because how Grand Blue um breaks down their event is that there is the big stream in in near Christmas, which is delayed till you know to January of this year, which is this one. And then the next one maybe anniversary, but anniversary is more like about gameplay updates. Like yeah, that's RPG. like they want they they see they keep saying they want to release this this game this year. They can't they can't be like oh we're gonna the next day the next time we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hear for this game is like almost half a year if not more. It's like if they want to release the game like this year, they kind of have to be They've gotta be like updates now. Yeah, yeah. If they're planning to release it this year and they're serious about it, the game's basically gotta be almost done and they're just doing polishing. Like uh, I feel like the big the big news is probably gonna come out on the summer. Like usually summer streams usually like every you know uh, if we don't get a release date by summer, is that it's a done deal. We're, we're, and, we're, we're pushing back to twenty twenty four. Yeah, then it's a done deal. Yeah, like I feel like the cool. summer is the most important stream for Relink. If if there is anything, I, I feel like they're gonna show off. Like, hey, the game is almost done, and then it will come out in I don't know, maybe September. That's that's my guess for Relink. It, it's not early, but I don't think I don't think it's anywhere near done. Even though they say they're in the final stretch, you know, <laughs> you know they they say that all the time. You know, it's like. I, I've been too too many times burned by what the director says a lot from Grand Blue. It's like, hey, yeah, you know, we, it took us a year to add two chapters to the story, but uh, it, we're trying to make it faster for next year. Mm, okay, years. all right, I'll, I'll, two years. I'll take <laughs> like, a Grand Blue veteran's word for it then. So I, I can't trust anything he says. You know, nice. he says, you know, we'll, we'll do a better job next time. And hey, remember the 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 first Grand Blue Fantasy Relink like, trailer thinks that coming twenty eighteen. Where are we? Where are we now? But. Uh, like there are some positive signs. I, I, like, it's like you know, it's developed in house now instead of by Platinum Games. So if it's in house, you know, I don't think you know anything. Oh no, 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 like that, that, that kind of think, think, think about it like this: game development is fucking hard. I and know. They, have to, they, have, they have to make a, a new development studio from the ground, and they have to make every single tool and asset from the ground because they have like a like a custom engine for this. I think like a proprietary and, engine. Like, or no, it's Unreal. Is it Unreal? I forgot what they did. It was Unreal back then. I it was know. Unreal with Platinum. I don't know what they are on right now. Um, but 
never call a developer lazy. Sometimes it's just a company restriction. No, you know, no. that put them. Yeah, in Oftentimes it's that they have like a boundary condition that they can't cross. Yeah. And it's like, well, you've got, you've got a week to fix this. Well, then we're not going to fix it or something like yeah. that. Like developers are some of the hardest working people that we know. It's just that they're put in some very shitty situations that they just can't make the perfect product that they want to put yeah. out there. So we'll see. Well, I mean, you know, we, we still hope that like the game will shape up and like, it does look good. Uh, you know, so there, there is another stream today. But mm-hmm. I feel like no one's going to attend this stream unless you're into the mobile game. Hell no, dude. I, I, I'm out. Uh, there's no fucking way I'm touching the mobile game ever okay. again. So. I, I got a very OP account if you want it. No. I know you have the OP Genshin account. I know you have the OP uh, Granblue account. I, I man, man, account. man, chow it here just like uh, saying to Josh, hey, I've got this bag of crack no here problem. if you want it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good. I swear. You just got to try it. I, I swear. <laughs> like, no, no, no applications. I, I could give it to whoever that wants it from from this staff channel. Well, unfortunately, we do have a lot more news to cover, though. I do know Relink has kind of been in the news cycle since its originally planned release in 2019. So uh, we talked last week or was it two weeks ago about how it didn't make our most anticipated list, mainly just because the marketing has been so up and down for it. But well, hopefully this year. when they... Yeah, hopefully, yeah, it didn't make it this year, but hopefully, it didn't make it onto our most anticipated list this year. Hopefully, the game stays at that 2023 listing. But at this point, it's it's just a guess. Who who knows? None of us. This, this is this implying that the game will release this year and it'll make it an anticipated list again. And there's uh, one last thing I forgot to add. The one thing that they added for the gotcha games that they said they're going to put in is that uh, anyone that completes the tutorial of the mobile game. They could pay 4,500 yen to get this thing where it gives you 300 rolls to get a free spark or a right. free pity. Please give us money. It's like, Classic. You, yeah. you have the privilege of spending money to get stuff. Oh, thank you. What a, what a deal. It, it, it's such a good deal. I mean, it's most a limited gotcha time games. offer. So, yeah. I mean, you can miss out on it if you don't get in on it. I mean, most spend gotcha money now or spend more money later. A roll, so. Yeah, if you spend money later, that deal's gone. Oh, uh, the so. ultimate cash grab. Side games is. So sorry. Like I just, just the I, I'm waiting for what what got what, what item codes are gonna be on relink and um versus rising because they love to do that. They love to like put uh item codes for the gotcha game in there to like valuable resources so they can just uh, make easy money. Um I think and it's the... not gonna be available for the Steam version uh again because of Steam refund policies, even yeah. though it's gonna be the same price to buy it on PC. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of it's kind of that's, uh, yeah it's kind of the weird thing of like that's kind of like one of the most prevalent like conversations is like will the steam version have that this time around it's like man i think the b- beer conversation should be psychic should be should be allowed to fucking do this period i think um I say, if there was some kind of promo codes i think it'll be the sands of eternity that's the new item they implemented in the game recently in the mobile game and that item is so rare, and you have to fight the hardest bosses to get them. Oh, well, there you go. And Easy money. They're used to uncap like the new was it Bahamut Summon? Mm-hmm. Um, what is it? They're so rare. I feel like they probably want to use that as as a way to get people to buy uh, it instead so of grindy. Rare. Like, okay, you have to like literally do like a million things to get these sands now, and it brought the game back to life. Somehow. Just simply just simply buy our game and you can get it for free and then you can just resell it right after because all you wanted to do we spent sixty dollars just to get a, a code for the game that's all you did I that's mean, what that's what people do that's what people do all the time I mean could they do the thing from the fighting I mean from the fighting game where you beat the RPG mode to get that one code instead like you had to like beat the game first to get it's like 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 buy the game because you want to play the game and not for like I, I know but I'm just saying like, like for like the Steam refund I mean could they just put that in I mean if you're forced to play the game and you play more than two hours you can't get a refund you know could that be a, a way to lock people in from cheating the system no dude I just say don't do it at all don't, don't even fucking do gotcha game codes don't do it I know but I'm just saying I don't, I don't want alternatives I don't want alternatives I don't want well, I can't do it like this just don't fucking do it it's so stupid it's so scummy oh wow <laughs> this is what it is, I guess. Mm-hmm. We will now segue into our second news topic of the week. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, there's no problem. Sounds like so that, broken. That, that, no, it's just that uh, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is, there's a lot of history there. And we've <laughs> talked about it for, for a few times on this podcast. So, for multiple uh, years. Yeah, across several years. Mm-hmm. 
We do have a game announcement this week. You know, we we do have a game announcement this week. Uh, it's from Idea Factory International and Compile Heart, so that might immediately turn some people off. And that <laughs> is Dokapon Kingdom Connect, which is a remake of Dokapon Kingdom, which released uh, in 2008 for Nintendo Wii and PlayStation 2. Now, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm not familiar with this game, but as our news post about it was tweeted out, I saw stuff about, like, broken friendships and things like that. I'm like, that sounds like Mario Party. And then if you think think Mario Party is bad about breaking friendships, this game is 10 times worse about it than (laughs) than breaking friendships. Because at least in Mario Party... Didn't the uh, super best friends, like, uh, um, do, like, a Dokupon Kingdom playthrough? And we all know how that ended. Yeah, for for basically people who don't know Dokupon Kingdom, it's basically, think of Mario Party... But instead of like you being part of like part of like Mario uh, characters, Nintendo characters, you're just straight up like RPG adventurers, and like you're all playing your own like full length RPG, but like on like a, on like a game board. Like mm-hmm. uh, it's a, it's a pretty cool concept. It's actually like really well designed. And the 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 thing that makes it like friendship breaking is just like Mario Party. Sometimes unlike Mario Party, where it's like a game can like last like. You know, three hours, maybe four hours, if you really like, you know, stretching it. Knock upon kingdom. You're thinking you're looking fifty plus hours, sometimes a hundred plus hours on a single game. And you know what? All those turns, like you know, like it's, for a good chunk of the game, it uh, it makes sense and it's logistical, and you can understand why people got to where they are. And then like the last five turns of the game happens, and it, the literally every single placement is up for grabs at the last five turns. And not everything else that happened before it doesn't really matter at that point. What's the level? Like, let's say the 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 player who's furthest behind becomes a darkling. It's over. You're you're they're gonna fuck you over. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's, it's even more it's, RNG it's than Royal Party. And I know I I know I already kind of introduced this, but I still just enjoy reading the the comments here. Oh boy, I can't wait to ruin lifelong friendships. Yeah. Uh, and then say goodbye to every friendship you ever had. Yeah, uh, let's. <laughs> It's awesome. Who's ready? Who's re- who's ready to not be friends anymore? Yeah, oh, I never, I never gave the, uh, I never gave the consoles. It's coming out on Switch, right? right. Sorry, Switch and Switch the big game. Thing with this is, the, the big thing is with this is like besides you know being a remake, you know, kind of looking you know more, more updated. Um, you know, it supports online multiplayer. So yeah, you know, if you really, really, really want to waste everyone's time anywhere, anytime, hit me up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go. Let's uh, let's uh, let's make a Dock Upon Kingdom uh, party in here and never talk to each other again and disband the podcast after. Damn, that's awesome. Our friendship's that fickle. Um, it's a, uh, it's it's it, it is definitely a game to remake. That's for sure. I'm I mean I'm, I'm 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 down to play it, even though I'm gonna I'm gonna get mad all over again. But I'm down. <laughs> We got a couple Wonderful. trailers for some uh, for some Square Enix properties here. Uh, one of these we kind of touched on earlier in a very minor way, and that is the final DLC for Stranger Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, Different Future. Uh, got a new trailer and a blog post from Square Enix detailing everything that's being added to to the final major package for this game. Uh, this is releasing on January twenty seventh, and they I don't know Jack Garland a gun. Yep. And I don't know if uh, James is planning to play this or Adam, uh, <laughs> if you've kept on top of these based on the reception from the first two DLCs. No, no. I, nope. I mean, I I wouldn't. It's not that I'm like opposed to playing the DLC. The problem is, is that I bought the game on Xbox like a fucking moron, which means that if I wanted to go through the levels and I need help, Nobody's gonna play with me. Nobody's I, I, playing this game on Xbox. I, I, th- I think oh, the no. safest option is wait for a Steam uh, release that just bundles everything together. And, yeah, this and game's still not on Steam. And everyone starts like from you know it'll it'll have a, a an active community once it's there. Mm. So, but I mean, and just once again, another DLC that looks really cool for this game. It's like holy shit, it's the Emperor from FF2. That's awesome. And like when you see like the footage of him, like you know the showdown with him, you see some of his dissidia and move set. It's like that's cool because the, like playing the Emperor and the and the Cydia games are is awesome. He's a he's a very like tricky zone type uh, character that can like uh, set traps all around the battlefield and throw projectiles to another your opponent. He's very fun to play. I'm like fuck. It just makes me want to play the <laughs> But I love to see the Emperor here. Now that I played uh, Slackers two and Valkyrie Elysium, like Stranger Paradise is my one. Th- 
there's more than one but it's the one major one i can think of it's like all right i still want to get to that from last year because i never made time so maybe a steam bundle would be the kick that i would need to do that yeah i mean i I would probably play it again because i i would like i want to check out these dlcs i don't know what sort of which i have to go through to 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 get through there but I, i do want to check them out it's just I I would need a, an active community to do that as well, mm. which is I don't know probably not active. Not on Xbox. <laughs> not a, yeah. The other Square Enix trailer that we got uh, is one that we we're kind of expecting, and that's for the upcoming Octopath Traveler two. And over the last few months, Square Enix has been releasing the character trailers in pairs, and this is the fourth of the four pairs of character trailers. This is detailing Ochet the Hunter and Cassidy or Casty the Apothecary. And when I was watching this trailer, I kind of realized like how bad my memory was because there, this trailer shows uh, Oshet with the like the monster capturing mechanic. Instead of having like a snow leopard as her main companion, she has an owl. And mm-hmm. uh, but it shows like some like choices that you have to make ba- based on which companion you bring with you. Uh, it calls this Traveler's Tales in the trailer, and I don't know if that's actually like what it's called in the game or it's something they're just titling it for the marketing. And they, what they're trying to like show here is that in Octopath Traveler 1, each story kind of played out linearly in like, across four chapters. Where here they're trying to, they've already talked about that cross paths mechanic where there are like side events to try to tie some of these characters together a bit more. But they're also trying to say uh, the examples they give here at the end are ways that the stories can diverge based on your choices. Like for instance, the thief character has to choose whether to kill the mother or the father first. The Particio, so the merchant. Funny. I, I, this is the first time I've seen this trailer, and you just see like her, like her choice was like kill father or kill mother. It's like what, the fuck? Yeah. what was this? What, what what was this called again? Cross path or something? Well, I'm surprised they didn't call it paths to walk. Yeah, <laughs> trails to walk. Well, 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 yeah. The. The, the cross paths things they've detailed before, Sorry. but now in this trailer, they're calling it Traveler's Tales. But basically, they're saying okay. there are a few permutations. Go ahead, Adam. So, yeah, there's been four updates to the, on this game ever since its announcement. One yeah. for each pairing of characters, and then they always introduce like another thing also yeah. in terms of the gameplay. This time, basically, they they in, in the press release, they called it Different Stories, Different Structures. Each Traveler's Tale has a different structure. Some have more than one objective, and you're free to choose how you want to proceed. Frone the Thief must decide whether to pursue Mother or Father first. If opting to pursue Father, Frone will make for the Thieves' Town of Winterbloom, where her target awaits. If choosing to pursue Mother, Throne will head to Osarush to find clues on her target's whereabouts. The Merchant Particio will, can head to his next main story objective, or he can follow the scent of commerce around the realm. So basically... What? The, the scent, scent of, of commerce. commerce. <laughs> yes, you can smell commerce. So basically what I'm getting at here is it seems like Octopath Traveler 2 is almost going down the list of like criticisms of the first game and trying to uh, address them. I'll take two examples. One of the criticisms wasn't there, was that there wasn't a lot of interaction between characters. And that's the cross paths function or storyline or mechanic or there's like each pair at least has like a pair story where at least two of the characters will interact with each other Mm -hmm. so that's like one criticism that they're addressing with this mechanic now how how well that actually will work uh, in implementation we'll we'll find out the the second criticism that i know several people had and i agree with it to some extent is that like of the eight characters in the original game like you said all of the structure was almost identical you go to like each character's story was in four chapters. You go to a different place and uh, you basically proceed from one chapter to the next, to the next, to the next for each character. They kind of all had like the same cadence to it and the same structure. So it seems like this time it's like almost more like a, like a saga frontier or something where like this character has like a slightly different, you know, you know, maybe openness to their structure. This character can go in two different route, two different ways. Or there's uh, for the hunter character, they say you can either choose the owl or the fox as your partner. Ah, that's what I'm wow. seeing. Yeah. So it's like it seems like they're trying to make a little bit more variety in terms of the characters, where like each of them works a little bit differently uh, in how they uh, how their structure is. And again, we'll see how well that that variety comes into play when we get our hands on the game. Well, yeah, that's definitely. Kind of, that's, the, that's the new thing they introduced this time around. Chad, Cha, did you uh, see the Japanese voice actress for uh, Ochet? Um, is that the Michiko? No, it's Aya Hirano. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! That's her. 
Hey, on, I dude. love Aya Hirano. I just, yeah. I just feel bad what happened to her career from a, from a little scandal. <laughs> Look, man, she is, she's bad. All right, she, she yeah. is the god tier voice actress. I don't care what you know what happens to you in real life. You know, mm-hmm. it's like if you're good at your job, you should get rewarded. You know, instead mm-hmm. of like stuff like that happening. But then again, saying something like that. You know that doesn't seem to apply too well with that's it. Mom's gonna, stick around. <laughs> Mom's gonna get you now. Sorry, it's all, it's over for you. Um, you know, um, uh, I, I kind of agree with Adam here. Of like, it it, it kind of feels like they're like they have like a checklist of things they want to meet, and it. I I really hope this is all implemented like fluidly and like and not just like bandages. Was, yeah, it, it, because you're you're definitely right. But it's like they yes yes the, these were real criticisms of the first game. And yeah, you should probably address them. I just hope they're, you know, smartly implemented rather than like, yes, then we did we did this right now, right? You can't criticize you like it now, right? Yeah, yeah, you can't criticize this anymore. <laughs> well, I will say that the the variety and the way that the the traveler's tales that they're calling it here, the cadence of the story, that sounds like good to me. The cross paths, I'm less sure on because it just seems like, don't worry, we've got these side stories where two characters interact. And I'm just like, is that the best way to implement that? I'm not. I'm trying not to criticize it until I see it, but it just seems like an awkward way to do that, where it's just like, okay, now do I just have eight independent stories, but also four paired stories alongside? Mm, yeah, but we'll, we'll uh, see how the, it actually uh, is. Uh, by the end of this game, like you'll have all your characters, but they'll all be blindfolded, so they can't acknowledge each other's existence in the party. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say that uh, this game just is a joy to look at. It, I think the implementation of HD 2D is a bit better here. It's I, I'm really looking forward to this, and there's a yeah, lot of I gameplay remember, in this the, the, in this trailer. The developers are very uh, adamant about saying like, "Hey, obviously the first game like is where like the genesis of HD 2D like was created, mm-hmm. and we really want this game to show how it's evolved, uh, you know, mm-hmm. like throughout since the first game and like showing off like." what the potential is of this uh, engine now mm-hmm. which is you know pretty exciting you know like like obviously like it, we, we were all like fascinated by the novelty of hd 2 d but now that we've seen it in other games it's like okay we know generally what uh, this can do it's like yeah i'm waiting to see how they try to wow us again with hd 2 d now that we've seen mm-hmm. it and we've been you know grown accustomed to it like what else is there to hd 2 d that will like really you know i kind of just the want them just to give step. just just give me some toggles. Give me a toggle for like low, high, no bloom, low, high, no depth of field, <laughs> things like that. Just uh, just turn it to the just the uh, SNES uh, RPG. Just give me that look. <laughs> no bloom, turn, no depth of field. That, 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 yeah, that's how you turn off all you turn off all the filters and it turns into that. And I guess we didn't talk about it, but the second character is uh, Casti, mm-hmm. Castiti, Castiti. Kesti, but she's the apo- apothecary of this game, so the alphan of this game. Uh, her main thing is that she doesn't know. Uh, she has like a traumatic past, but is, has uh, amnesia, so she's not exactly sure what happened or why she is an apothecary. Um, one of her path actions is she can like drug people and put them to sleep, which is kind of fun. So I'm like, I don't think that was a, I don't think that was in the first game. That seems a little bit dubious, but sure, we'll take it. I'll take I guess it. compared to being a, a being a thief or whatever, isn't any more noble. So we'll take it. Drug me and put me to sleep. Do it. Uh, we got a couple more trailers here. We got a trailer for the upcoming Like a Dragon Ishin from RGG Studios. We've gotten like the gameplay focused trailer about the four different combat styles. So what else is there to talk about? Of course, it's the mini games. So we basically got a, a trailer that's focusing on farming, focusing on helping pets, cooking, and things like that. Was this all in? Chop up an onion. Yeah, yeah. The, these are, these were all in uh, the 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 original release of Ishin. Like Ishin had like some of the best mini games in the series. So you know, just. <laughs> Uh, a delight to see, you know, them coming back and like a lot of people's gonna be their first time uh seeing all of this. It's it's awesome. It's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Like the 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 one where you like you chop cannonballs in half is really funny. <laughs> I, I like the focus on the cooking here with the uh f- filleting the fish and things like that. Mm-hmm. It's right, it's a proper GRPG has fishing. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, is coming out pretty much around the same time as Octopath Traveler 2 in late February. Uh, we also got a trailer for Sword Art Online Last Recollection, which doesn't have a release date, but is slated for 2023. Um, I'll be honest, um, I didn't watch this trailer. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's the it's the War of the Underworld arc, you know. Uh, they're, they're focusing on that arc of SAO, um, obviously with their own spin out of it, the original characters. There's not really much to say about it because, like, it's it, if you've played the previous SAO games, you know what to expect. They're gonna 
somewhat retell the events of how they uh, were shown in the, in the light novel and in the anime, but with their own spin to it because of these original characters. That's... My immediate reception to this is mm-hmm. it's like, it looks bad. And I'm just talking about like character fidelity animation, specifically like the mouth movement is really awkward. It just is like, I don't know, just like, the VR, they're just like, it, it looks like it looks, very like, it looks like the last game. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> oh, now, now that I'm watching, now that I'm watching I'm the trailer, that the last I game looked good. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, it, uh, to me, it looks like the last game because I, I didn't, I didn't something pay could, that much attention to the last game. Something could sue yeah, me. I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to this one either. Yeah, something could sue me. And I actually played the last game. I didn't finish it. I was like, I don't know. There's something to this. And in some respects, yes. But at the same time, I was like, I don't care. <laughs> But I I still can't get over the stigma of the last recollection. Sometimes that that it's not a dot hack game. Yeah, it's uh, it's still it still stings a little. I, I I don't know if I can ever forgive this game. And the last major piece of news this week, we still have a few minor things after this. The last major one is uh, something that I think a few people were expecting earlier, and that is for Marvel's Avengers. A game which I am on record on an early edition of this podcast saying that this game was too big to fail and was going to like sell gangbusters, which apparently it didn't. Uh, it is going to get its last major update this year in a, just a few weeks, and the official support will be discontinued uh, on September 30th. So the game will still be playable and have servers up, but it's not going to get any more content or updates. Uh, which... Service announcement. But you can still access it at least. There's better than right. 95% of the EOS announcements. So, I mean, uh, it makes sense, you know. The <laughs> if if nothing's really doing it for the game and no one's really coming back, besides like a lot loyal small following, like there's no there's no point in continuing to dump money into it. It's it's the logical conclusion of all these the these types of things. If you don't have the player player base, there's no reason to keep on going like this. I, but I, I guess wonder... I don't I don't get oh, this one thing and then I'll and then I'll hand it off to Chow. Yeah. It's like so it's going to be delisted from storefronts on September 30th. Physical copies will be sold until they run out. The servers mm-hmm. will be online, so you can still play this in multiplayer yeah. online, but it's just also delisted. So I'm just thinking like if the servers are still up, sure, like a game, any service game is gonna end out of run out of content sooner or later and this game released in 2020 so it, it had two years of content is that a failure i don't know but I just the fact that they're not going to sell it anymore hey, 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 here's how I see it. like uh, obviously like the, the it not being sold anymore is probably because the licensing run out they're not going to uh, renew the license ah uh, there you go yeah the, the, that that's that's the logical thing to to, to get out of this the, i don't I, I think the servers are going to be alive right now i think it's one of those things that they'll sunset it like sometime yeah. down the road it's not one of those it's like it's gonna be permanent like mm-hmm. i'll be surprised if the servers are still online like three years from now let's say you okay. know like, um because you know like eventually that that pool that well will dry up you know and there's gonna be no point like what are we why do we have these servers still online um so yeah i mean it may it makes sense you know there's there, there's no point to keep on supporting this game if it's not like i don't think there's anything that the avengers could do to back and get like to get get into a state that's like you can make the case internally and be like yeah we could continue supporting this this game like i don't think they can do anything at this point it's it's good as dead because it's like what the license probably cost them a fortune to get back if they want to like renew it so it's like screw it just just kill it off immediately and you know and and marvel is more concerned with other things like they they want to put the avengers behind them too like on right they want but they want to they want to look forward to like the next spider-man game you know for example they want to continue to like supporting marvel snap like they 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 don't want things that are just like obviously like on some level tarnishing them you know (laughs) Mm-hmm. They, they, they want things that people are either looking forward to or like currently successful you know like i i i still wonder like what they think like on marvel's perspective like how midnight suns did like was it cool for them was it not i don't know well that's pretty much all we can say on that uh, i guess there are always a little caveat well not caveat but the fact that this was developed by crystal dynamics underneath square enix which was recently sold to the Embracer Group, so apparently, basically, ownership just more trying to cut their yeah, losses. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's also like a, a weird thing too, where like 
is it is it feasible to have, still have this product when like Crystal Dynamics is like technically not under Square Enix anymore either? And they're apparently working on that Tomb Raider reboot reimagining where they're trying to like like the t- uh, we're not covering Tomb Raider s- explicitly, but like that series has like three major arcs, like different like canons, and apparently the new game is trying to like combine them, so you'll have classic Tomb Raider. Uh, oh, anniversary okay. Tomb Raider and new Tomb Raider underneath the same banner. I don't know. That's apparently what Crystal Dynamics is working on. So we'll see All if that right. ends up being. Um, I've only I've only in it as like Grandma Croft or something. I was just gonna say one last thing, uh, mm-hmm. Brian. Did mm-hmm. you thought that this is gonna be a massive success before the game was gonna? gonna uh, be I guess I did. Like, and that's well, I I was ignorant, obviously, and I was wrong. I mean, like, you're not alone. You know, a lot of people have had the same mindset. I'm like, yeah, this is like, this is crazy, and like, yeah, it's probably too big to fail. Like that, like it's like. I think I'm the only person that that, that probably thought I don't really care about this game. And I mean, there, 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 there's a, there's a difference between you caring and you thinking that like it's too big to fail. It's not like Brian. No, 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 no. no, no. I, I actually much. don't think like Marvel like translate well to video games that it would see like that massive success that they were hoping. But, like, yeah, just, but there's there's been more Marvel hits than misses in gaming. Like you, people are so focused on Avengers that they forget everything else that came out of Marvel. They got the Spider-Man games on PlayStation and now PC, both very successful, both get, and, and like getting a sequel. You have Marvel Snap from last year, which is doing big, big, big numbers, very, very popular right now, very hot. And you had little cool projects like Midnight Suns. It's like you know, I don't know how well it sold, but like, but it was a damn good, fine game, you know. And like mm-hmm. people are so focused on like what happened to Avengers, and like and I, and I, I almost almost forgot uh, Guardians of the Galaxy as well. But you know? uh, those were before those things were announced. I, I mean, thought that yeah. this game was going to be like the sort of game that you could slap on a Target end cap and mom would buy it for their kid. Then this was announced, uh, um, like at the hype of Endgame and whatever was before Endgame, but apparently didn't didn't quite latch on. Yeah, to, that, to the zeitgeist. Sweet. But that's okay, you know, because there's there's cooler Marvel projects always in the works. You know, you know, you don't always have to focus on the Avengers. You can focus on cooler things like like a Morbius DLC for Midnight oh, Suns. God. It's more of a time, I guess. <laughs> and then we have a few uh, release dates and smaller updates here. Uh, one of which is for an upcoming game that we can't really talk about too much because we haven't had a chance to play it at, in any capacity, and that's Forspoken. This is obviously uh, the Luminous Productions Square Enix game that's releasing uh, at the time of recording, like in three days on June, January 24th. Um, I'm not sure who's covering this for the site. It kind of depends on when we get a chance to play it because chances are it'll just be released and anyone who wants to play it can buy it and play it. But uh, the main news here is that Square Enix has revealed the PC requirements for this game and they are quite hefty. Uh, They have a minimum recommended in Ultra and this is a little bit dry, so I'm not going to dive into this too much. But the idea here is, is that if you have a like a, they, they list the both Radeon and the um, GeForce equivalents here, or, or mostly equivalents. If you have a 3070, which is an expensive, pretty modern GPU, they're saying that you can probably play this game at 1440p 30 FPS. In order to play this at 4K 60, they're recommending an NVIDIA 4080. Uh, and then there's a few other details here that maybe James can elucidate on a bit, but the, it just seems like they're recommending 30 FPS for first spoken unless you got a video card that is a grand or more. Um, so very, very hefty requirements here yeah, uh, for yeah. the PC version. Not to say anything about the state of the PC version, because again, like as has been going around the last couple of days, apparently nobody has PC code. Awesome. And if there is, and if there is any PC code out there, it is so incredibly limited that, that nobody has spoken up about having it. So but um, what if anyone who tried to run this game like blue screened their computer and did, it died and they can't talk about it? It's like that's NDA. Don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Trash game. Well, anyone run? Well, the one thing I will say is is that completely disregarding performance, which obviously we shouldn't. Uh, the PS5 version in the performance mode, which targets 60 FPS, has dips down to 720p. Hell yeah! So mm-hmm. people like looking at these specs and saying. Why are they so hefty? It's like it's not necessarily that the PC version 
is bad, it's more likely that for whatever reason, the game is incredibly taxing, which, hey, remember, this is a current gen only game. And you're seeing similarly hefty like uh, requirements from Returnal, which also got PC requirements that were listed this week. This is why when I this is like one of the reasons why when uh, the PS5 and Series X were coming out, I told people, hey, make sure your PC is at least as strong as these systems or you're going to be having a bad time <laughs> in like a few like a year or two. It took a bit longer because of the the pandemic and the longer cross-gen period, but we're finally getting to that point where it's like games are starting to be current-gen only. This is going to be more and more common, and yeah. people are freaking out about it because of Forspoken, because well, people are looking for reasons to hate that game. And right. I'm not saying it's going to be good or bad, but it's like that game just can't catch a break. And I think this whole PC requirement stuff, it's like, it's getting shit on because it's the first current gen, like current gen exclusive. Well, no, not even because like I remember the medium when that came out had really intense like like requirements and didn't oh, yeah. run very well. And it's like, no, this this is just going to be a thing. But did they release the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the PC specs for Returnal uh, coming port? Yeah. Oh, OK. How, how's that looking? I forgot. I didn't look into it. Um. <sighs> But one second, I, I know that uh, for 4K60 with ray tracing, they uh, listed a 3080 Ti or 6950 XT with the expectation that you're using either FSR2 or DLSS. Oh, OK. Interesting. So, okay. Oh. yeah, that's getting to that point. I, and remind I, I, me, uh, sorry, um, Forspoken yeah. is going to support Fidelity FX. That's AMD's FSR, version of DLSS. Yeah. Oh, OK, yeah. Sweet. Uh, importantly, FSR 2, which is the version that you actually want it to support, because there's still mm -hmm. some games coming out with FSR 1, which is just a regular, like, uh, spatial upscaler that doesn't use, like, uh, frame accumulation, which is the whole reason why FSR 2 and DLSS are actually usable and good. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit of technical jargon there, but basically, if, uh, if a game is supporting FSR 1.0, it they shouldn't have even bothered supporting FSR in the first place. Just play at a lower resolution. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'm going to play this yeah. on 720p, 120 FPS. Let's hey, go. haven't you seen this uh, PC set where they put like a CRT playing like the most modern games and, you know, with a lower resolution, you can play in a lower spec, but then you're getting 60 FPS all the time with that awesome mm. CRT monitor. Hmm. It'd be a nightmare. Anyways, I'm very. I'm very curious how Forspoken will run on Steam Deck because they've already confirmed it's going to be playable. Okay. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. If <laughs> you'll boot it up, be, it sets the Steam Deck on fire. Verified. Probably going to be upscaling from like something like 360p using FSR or something. <laughs> uh, at least it's a good thing it's not a Epic exclusive, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Okay. I'm, I, they, they wouldn't be advertised. They literally like Valve literally had the devs like uh, on, like um, at their booth for TGS to talk about Forspoken and they're advertising the game coming to Steam Deck. It's not Epic exclusive. Thank God. But I, I still don't see much hope for this game. I feel it looks way too expensive. And I, I feel like it's all, uh, like I said, like I don't know if I pay a full $70 for this game, but I do want to play this game at some point. I, 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 I like, want I'm a sucker for fucking like cool wizard shit and like a magic based game. That's not Harry Potter because I I never got into Harry Potter and I guess that was a good uh, that 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 was the right choice uh, yeah. up until this point. But I am a sucker for cool magic shit and like if you if you if, if this game allows me like has somehow like pulls it together and has like really fun gameplay with its magic system, then like I'll be I'll I'll be crazy this game. Well, yeah. hopefully we can uh, talk about this game next week to some extent. We'll um, and then if it's good, we'll title that episode "Cool Magic Shit." There we go. The, no, the, the 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 podcast services wouldn't like that. Then there's cussing. Uh, the, uh, uh, cool magic stuff. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just cross we'll just it. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go into a couple release dates here. Um, Marvel's Midnight Suns, which uh, Josh mentioned earlier, which came out in December is getting its first DLC pack on Janu January 26th. Uh, this DLC pack, the main thing about it is that it adds uh, Deadpool to the game. 
So if you're playing Marvel's Midnight Suns and you're a fan of uh, the newest rendition of Deadpool, he's being added to to that game uh, at the end of the month. Uh, that's, you gonna play this, Josh? Uh, I'm gonna wait till everything's out for the DLC, like how I usually do for games. Yeah, like, I, I can't do it piecemeal, but it is cool that like they. It's more than I thought. You know, I thought it'd just be the character in like some stages, but they're actually doing a whole new enemy type. And um, they had like a whole new boss and everything for that. Like that's that's more than I thought because when you think about a whole new enemy type, like there's there, there's gonna be different variations of that enemy type, and mm-hmm. that game is very good at like switching things up uh, when it uh, introduces that type of stuff. So that's you know it's that's cool, but I I don't okay. I, I might be tempted when they add more BS to this game that I maybe I'll go check that <laughs> out when that got that hits. Maybe I kind of like I have I have, I need to like I need to know. So maybe yeah. it'll it'll get me back into that. And Deadpool, on the, on a, yeah, we, we, we see Deadpool before, you know. We know what he's capable. Morbius, let's fucking go. <laughs> on a similar front to the idea of waiting until all the DLCs out, uh, we got a sales update for Pathfinder: Wrath of the Righteous. Uh, this game has surpassed one million units sold, so it shows that Alcat has found um, a good audience for their CRPGs. And alongside uh, Wrath of the Righteous. Was originally going to get three DLCs, but last year it was announced that they're, that Alcat is upping that to six, and the fourth one is going to be released in March. So because it's getting such incremental updates throughout this year, like by the time all six are out, I might find time to replay this and have a whole lot to chew back into chew back in. Two hundred hour playthrough. Well, the first one was one hundred, so now that it has six mm-hmm. DLCs attached, probably. Uh, yeah, so we're not ignoring the updates to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. It's just you only have so much time, and I can't replay the game every time they add one thing in DLC. Yeah, it's, it's uh, hey, the, the good on them for like kind of getting the, the CRPG genre rolling, you know, like they mm-hmm. found a good, uh, a good uh, community there. Like, uh, they're doing um, Rogue Trader, right? Right. I, and I forget, I forget if that one's slated for this year or not, but yeah, they're, they're, uh, that'll be there and likely my foray into Warhammer 40K. Yeah, like a. Yes. The, so I'll, have to, I'll have to poke at Seed House to educate me on that stuff. Yeah, just just as an aside, like, like I, I'm not really into the Warhammer universe, but I do like checking out like their games here and there, like Space Marine. I really like, you know. But it's just like it's cool that like I kind of wish Star Wars got that treatment that Warhammer does. Like, sure, there's like a lot of like maybe questionable games, but you see so much variety in Warhammer games that like you're bound to like one. Hmm. Uh, two more release dates here. One is actually a delay. Uh, Atelier Rise of 3, which was originally slated to release on the same day as Octopath Traveler 2 on February 24th. It's being delayed a month. So Rise of 3 will now release on March 24th. I kind of saw is, uh, this coming because uh, I, I distinctly remembered when we got uh, Will Long Code and I was like, huh, wasn't the last time Koei Tecmo did this like with Rise of 2? And I checked, and I was like, oh, they sent out Rise of 2, like, two and a half months ahead of time. I wonder if this game is, if Rise of 3 is going to get delayed. And then, lo and behold. <laughs> is this good for you, James? Uh, No, because now it releases the same day as uh, Resident Evil 4 Remake. Oh, sh- wait, oh, yeah, I forgot I got a date. Oh, man. Well, I'm, it's, it's I'm sorry. To- I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Leon S. Candy. Oh, I no. have to wait. Oh, well, Resident Evil Four, uh, Resident Evil Four is a short game, right? Well, maybe the remake won't be. Well, all Resident Evil games are about like eight to ten hours. Yeah, play, play, play play through. through, and then you can speed run them in like three. Except for six, which is too long. <laughs> Let's go. What was that? What was Wesker's son's name? Jake. Yeah, it's Jake. Hell yeah, our yeah, guy. Yeah, Baker's voice. <laughs> Man, and the last I'll shit on that game for. But I actually enjoy it. Look, I, I, yeah, I, I, like I have some friends that like are are big like uh, supporters of Resident Evil Six. They really like the gameplay, which you know I can uh, I respect. Play, I, I don't agree, with, but I respect. You just gotta play with a friend. If you have no you friends, oh, yeah. then then well, good luck. And don't play five and six. <laughs> and the last bit here is for a game that we'll probably be waiting on for a good while longer, and that is Black Myth: Wukong. This is a game being published and developed by Game Science at first. We first saw footage of it either late 2021 or early 2022. I forget exactly. Um, it's a game that even when it was first shown, we figured was pretty far out. Uh, it's going to be developed on Unreal Engine 5. Well, Game Science has released a little fun and cute uh, stop motion video celebrating the Chinese New Year uh, this year for Year of the Rabbit. 
And in that little promotional video, they have shown, at least listed so far, that Black Myth Wukong is currently slated for a summer 2024 release. I have a um, question for you on this. Yeah. Does this game release before or after Grand Blue Fantasy Relink? After. Oh, I'm guessing this game is going to be pushed it further. Has to be it has to be after. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think it could get delayed that okay. long. I think, I think he was joking that Relink is supposed to be out this year, but will it make it this year? <laughs> Thank you, Adam. No, well, no, 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 I mean, I got the joking. joke. You, you can't trust that director saying, oh, it's coming this year. You take everything for face value. You can't do that. <laughs> I remember I remember in 2021, the direct, the Grand Blue director was like, we'll probably have a hard release date around the 8th anniversary of Grand Blue in March 2022. And now we're almost at March 2023. But anyways, um, I thought this little this little uh, game science Wukong video was kind of cute. It's yeah. stop motion. There's a rabbit. He's trying to install Wukong on his like Windows 98 machine. It doesn't work. <laughs> That's a fun little premise. <laughs> it should, you know, it should work though. God he stops at the store. He buys a monster GPU from a tiger, and then he's good to go. But then he realizes the game's not out yet. Yeah, it's adorable. <laughs> well done on that part. <laughs> the, the the creative team behind it must have had a blast making this video. And I guess it was uh, originally announced in late 2020. So we've been waiting a while and it looks like we're going to be waiting a while longer. But I think, unlike Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, this is the first time they've given a year where in Grand Blue Fantasy, there's a, you know, that semi, you know, famous image where they're saying coming 2019. It's well, going to be, think... it's, it's going it's to be cool, right? Because we have like a whole long and then uh, we have Black Myth Wukong coming right the year after. Like, it's like, it's like a good, like, healthy dose of like, big big titles that like uh, are like chinese inspired like like mythical arts martial arts that was the well there's that is, is what there's also that is an electronic arts or is it, is it ea there's that no, other wild one hearts. no okay wild yeah hearts? wild hearts is ea then yeah but the there was another action game that was announced oh yeah for is, like ps5 the, the the state of play was so, that yeah in? way of ronin or path of ronin what was it? Oh man, I'm I, think, I, think, I think I think the Japan and Rise of Ronin. Know. It's called yeah, Rise, of Ronin. It's Rise of the Ronin. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, who's publishing that one again? That's uh, Sony. Toy Tecmo. Sony. Well, yeah, it's oh. Sony publishing it, kind of like uh, how Sony uh, published uh, Neo One and Two, but specifically Neo Two on PS4, PS5. Toy Tecmo published it themselves. Yeah, that's weird. Correct. Okay, that, I don't know how that works. Yeah, so we'll have a uh, black. Uh, we'll have Black Myth Wukong later and res the ronin maybe this year and then um uh well long obviously in just a month or so and that covers it for this podcast so i think this was a really good one we had a lot of obviously a lot of games that we could talk about directly that we've been playing uh obviously the first major release of the year and a lot of things we're looking forward to uh this is a really really good podcast and i think it's going to be kind of at this level of quality hopefully going for the next few weeks so obviously i'm glad we had the full crew here to talk about all these games and uh as we dig into fire emblem and go into uh hopefully forespoken in the next week you can find rpg site uh on the net rpg site.net and of course you we encourage you to visit to read all the features and reviews that we mentioned at the start of this podcast uh for fire emblem the preview for wall long and all the other ones like the persona three and four impressions uh, you can find RPG site on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And on YouTube, we do have the uh, the gameplay footage for the Switch version of the upcoming Labyrinth of Galleria. Uh, join our Discord at discord.gg slash RPG site if you're playing Fire Emblem or any of the other RPGs that have released in the last year to join the community and talk about them there. It's been popping lately. Very active. Yeah, it's been it's been a kind of a fun little crescendo to see more and more people add, uh, join and add to the discussion there. And of course, if you listen to this podcast, uh, either directly through the site or on YouTube or on any of the podcast services, uh, feel free to leave us a rating or a comment. We love uh, we love seeing those and replying to them if we can. And of course, we'll, we, we will be back next week with another edition of the TetraCast. And hopefully it'll just be as, uh, as packed and popping as this one. Uh, thank you so much for listening. As always, stay safe and take care. We'll talk to you next time. Better, everyone. I'm more longing. <laughs>